two minutes. Start now, huh? on time, huh? Quiet. Okay. Uh, Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Um, our topic today will be about surgical management of glaucoma. Uh, next week we'll have a second lecture as well, but it will be about managing, you know, post-operative complications or surgical complications. So um, if you have the uh, schedule of the subspecialty lectures, so just you need to adjust the topic. It's not complications of glaucoma. It's managing post-operative and intraoperative complications, okay? Uh, most of you have encountered, you know, or have seen, you know, glaucoma surgeries before. Uh, basically, this lecture is just to wrap up everything that you had and or you have learned before about glaucoma surgeries and put it in a systematic way. So before talking about glaucoma surgery, we need to know certain things about the principle of intraoperative control. So, um, there is you know, some misunderstanding about the intraocular pressure, that we need a target or a magical number to follow all over the, the patient's follow-up, which is actually wrong. So the target IUP, it's not a fixed number or a static number. It actually changes depending on the long-term monitoring according to the visual field progression, OCT changes, and the clinical assessment. If the patient is progressing on the target intraocular pressure, we have set, then we might need to, to lower it further. On the other hand, if the patient is stable on our target pressure, it may be well that it could, we, we could actually take the pressure higher a little bit. If the patient is actually stable on these uh, previous three criteria that we have mentioned, clinical assessment, visual field, and OCT. So we need to discuss with any glaucoma patient the nature of his disease. It's a progressive disease that needs long life follow-up and long life monitoring. We need to mention for him the risks and benefits of observation, medical, laser, and surgical treatment as well, and the side effects of all of these things that we are going to offer for our patients. But the question arises, why do we actually operate our patients? So what's the main reason to operate the patient? Of course, our task uh, as ophthalmologists is to preserve the vision, not only the visual quantity, but also quality, okay? So we should not only uh, you know, look for the visual acuity, but also the visual quality. If you can actually you know, preserve his you know, restriction of visual field, then that's actually, you know, it's a good achievement that you could do for your glaucoma patient. We need to preserve the quality of life, meaning that we need actually to allow the patient to enjoy his life without having you know, a huge bag which contains lots of anti-glaucoma medications and the adjunct lubricants that he might need to use after using his anti-glucoma medication. We need to decrease the, the anti-glucoma medication burden, follow-up schedule, and the so uh, socioeconomic burden as well, because some of the patients are buying their drops from their own pockets. Just a few words about the adherence to anti-glucoma medications. So we need just to admit that the adherence to anti-glucoma medication in our society is fairly poor. Decreasing the medication might improve the adherence. That's why we need to think about combination therapy, like. COSOPT, COMBIGAN, and uh, prostaglandin with beta blocker combination as well. Educating the patient about their disease and treatment should improve patient adherence and should reduce the risk of significant progression as well by their excellent compliance on anti-glucoma medication. Regardless, glaucoma progression do exist. So why is that? Sometimes the disease severity can lead to actual glaucoma progression. We have certain interesting glaucoma called refractory glaucoma. So whatever you do, the glaucoma will progress. Even you, if you hit him with the full medication, you operate him several times, it's refractory disease. It's a severe disease. 
The mechanism of glaucoma plays an important role as well, and the response, quality of life and compliance, the cost, especially if the patient is buying his medication on his own, and the associated side effects, which are well known for all of us, like you know, patients who are on uh, beta blockers, carbon canhydrase inhibitors, uh, severe allergy to the, to the preservatives associated with the drops, bilocarbon and irritation, redness, and so on. So glaucoma disoptic uh, progression is higher on patients on medical treatment than surgical treatment on a successful surgery, of course, and it's well documented in the literature. Surgery is usually done at late stage after medical and laser treatment have failed. That's why we have you know, glaucoma progression. Earlier and aggressive treatment is therefore required and crucial in such patients with advanced disease and poorly controlled inter uh, intraocular pressure. The choice of surgery depends on the degree of optic nerve head and visual field damage. So you need actually to look at the presumed target pressure, if it's in the low teens, high single digits. You need to look for the mechanism of glaucoma, the visual potential, risk of intraoperative and postoperative complication, the presence of cataract, and discuss with the patient the surgical options as well. Simply, glaucoma surgery depends on the aqueous dynamics. So you have glaucoma surgery which controls the aqueous production or which targets the aqueous production, and we have glaucoma surgery which enhances the aqueous outflow. So simply we have glaucoma surgeries that actually work on the inflow. Non-incision like cyclocryotherapy, transcleral cyclophotocoagulation, ultrasound ciliary plasty, and we have the incisional ones which include endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation. Those which work on the outflow mechanism, there are some certain procedures which actually aim to restore the physiologic pathway, including internal approach like the eye stent, trabectome, and so on. We have you know, a few other procedures as well. We have the external approach like canalplasty and viscocanalostomy. We have those which work on a non-physiologic pathway, including trabeculectomy, deep sclerectomy, glaucoma drainage device, and express shunt, and other procedures as well. Um, once you plan to operate your patients, most of the time you need to use anti-glaucoma, uh, sorry, anti-metabolites. We have two main antibiotics to be used with glu uh, during glaucoma surgery, including metamycin and 5-FU. Metamycin is an antineoplastic antibiotic. It's isolated from streptomyces. It intercalates with the DNA and prevents replication. So it suppresses subsequently fibrosis and vascular ingrowth, but it, because it's toxic to the fibroblast, but it has some toxicity to the corneal endothelium as well. It can cause corneal decompensation if it leaks to the AC. It can cause anterior chamber inflammation. It has scleral, ciliary body, and iris necrosis effect as well, and it can cause retinal toxicity upon leakage to the intraocular tissue. Five of you, on the other hand, it affects this phase of the cell cycle. It's toxic to the epithelium and requires several postoperative injections compared to few postoperative injections while using metamycin C. However, remember that metamycin C is far more potent than 5-FU. So let's talk about trabeculectomy. So trabeculectomy was first described in 1967. It's based on the principle guarded filtration under guarded flap. So aqueous will flow from the fistula to the subconjunctival flap, uh, to the sorry, subconjunctival flap and tissue under the scleral flap. The initial success rate was 37 to 85%, which increased, uh, increased subsequently upon the introduction of metamycin C. So it increased the success rate to about 6,700%, but also increased the rates of postoperative complications as well. The advantages of trabeculectomy is that it can lower the intraocular pressure, and it's a cheap procedure. You can do it in any place. You don't require lots of instruments to do it. However, we have some certain disadvantages. It's actually the same technique since 50 years ago, so it did not evolute so much. There are some little bit higher rate of complications compared to other modern anti-glucoma uh, sorry anti-glucoma surgeries. Some of these complications are vision-threatening complications. It's cataractogenic, and it had high intermediate and long-term uh, failure, and the lifelong risk uh, of failure and complications is existing as well. And it needs frequent visits postoperatively to monitor for any postoperative complication. So, actually, you can do it for any patient. Patient who failed the medical therapy or have disturbance of the quality of life because of the anti-glucoma medication burden, those who need lower IUP regardless of the anti-glucoma drops or the previous laser procedures. We should know that there are some certain patients who have risk factor for failure more compared to their peers. Those with dark skin pigmentation, those with prior surgery, those who are having conjunctival scarring and tendency to colloid formation, aphecic, those with ocular surface disease, uveitis, neovascular glaucoma, and prolonged use of anti-glucoma medication because of the subconjunctival fibrosis. 
The steps are very simple. You need just to actually give the patient local anesthesia. You can do it under subterranean anesthesia as well. You need to put a traction suture so that you can pull the globe inferiorly near the, uh, in the cornea near the limbus superiorly. Conjectival perotomy, either fornix or limbal base. Now mostly it's fornix because you want to have a low diffuse blip. You need to dissect the tino capsule and you have to cauterize to prevent the pooling of blood and subsequent, you know, you will have uh, scarring of the blip if you leave it. You need to have a good scleral flap dissection, put your antibiotic, then irrigate thoroughly with BSS. You need to do a paracentesis so that you can inflate the anterior chamber after doing your sclerotomy, then doing peripheral aridectomy because you want to make sure that the anterior chamber is not collapsing after you know, closing the flap. And you need to assist the filtration and make sure that there is adequate ooze if you are planning to have a good filtration and if there are no certain in, uh, indications before the surgery to have a tight flap and subsequent laser suture lysis. You should close the conjunctiva tightly. It should be watertight closure to avoid any leak and then give your subconjunctival injections. So simply, uh, if you are going for uh, trabeculectomy, as we mentioned, you will insert your traction suture, then you will have your scleral, or sorry, your conjunctival perotomy. You will cauterize gently. After that, you will uh, create your scleral flap. After that, you will dissect it very well. Avoid bed you know, irregularities so that you will avoid the bed fibrosis. Then you will put your metamycin. You can apply it for two minutes or three minutes or so on. If you are doing, it, uh, doing a combined procedure, you can after that go to do your FACO. Then you need to go back to your uh, trabeculectomy, complete your dissection, do your, your uh, paracentesis at the bed, use the killy punch, so that's the killy punch to do your sclerotomy. Then you will do your peripheral iridectomy. After that, you will close the flap and, and check for any overfiltration or adequate filtration after that. Then you will close your conjunctiva tightly. So the postoperative care consists of ophthalmic evaluation first day postoperatively, looking for the visual acuity, the intraocular pressure leak, and the blip configuration, anterior chamber depth, and posterior pole examination, looking for any choroidal or supracoroidal hemorrhage if the patient is in, is in pain with high pressure. So you need to start the patient on topical anti antibiotics and topical steroids and atropine, if you have combined surgery, if you have uveitis, you can use it as well. Actually, if you have uveitis, you should use atropine to prevent what? Sinica formation. There are some certain complications that could happen after trabeculectomy. Some of them are preoperative, some of them are intraoperative, some of them are early or late postoperative complications. The preoperative complications include retrobulbar hemorrhage while giving your local anesthesia. So managing it simply by canthotomy and cantholysis and decrease your intraocular pressure. This is one of the classic you know, preoperative complications that you need to know how to manage and how to diagnose. Intraoperative complications consists of conjunctival buttonholes, flap tears and holes, and you can manage them by simply suturing them. Vitreous loss, it can happen sometimes with trabeculectomy alone, especially in congenital glaucoma, or in patients who have in combined surgery, and just you will do your simple vitrectomy, suprachoroidal hemorrhage, bleeding, and we'll come over these complications in our lecture next week. Early postoperative complications briefly with good intraocular pressure include hyphema, uveitis, and delinformation. Early postoperative uh, complications with low intraocular pressure in the presence of formed blip include overfiltration. In the presence of flat blip include wound leak, choroidal effusion, ciliary body shutdown, cyclodiasis cleft, and retinal detachment. Early postoperative complication in the presence of high IUP with deep anterior chamber include a blockage to the internal fistula, tight flap or external blockage because of the bleeding. High IUP with shallow or flat anterior chamber can occur because of pupillary block, suprachoroidal hemorrhage, equus misdirection. So if the IUP is fine, you will have high femur, uveitis, dilin. If it's low with formed lip overfiltration, with flat lip, wound leak, choroidals, Cellular body shut down, cyclodialysis cleft, and RD. If you have a high IOP early postoperatively with deep chamber, think about internal blockage to the fistula or external blockage or tight flap. With shallow chamber, think about pupillary block, suprachoroidal hemorrhage, and aqueous misdirection. We have late postoperative complications, which include cases with good IOP like cataract, infection like blebitis, blib related endophthalmitis, and corneal dissection. We have late postoperative complications with low IOP as well, including hypotonium maculopathy and leak. And we have late postoperative complications with high IOP, such as 
blip encapsulation, internal block, delayed laser social light with subsequent scarring, scars or flat blip, and the natural blip failure which comes with time. Another filtering glaucoma surgery uh, and incisional surgery includes express shunt. The express shunt is a stainless steel device which is MRI compatible. It's a non-valve flow restricting device. It comes in two, in two you know, internal lumen diameters, either 50 micron or 200 micron. So with the 50 micron, it's impossible to, uh, to have actually hypotony because of a 50 micron lumen, which is actually lower than the sclerotomy size, which can be between 300 and 500 micron, okay? The external lumen is 400, but the internal lumen come in 50 and 200. So you have P50, which include an internal lumen of 50 micron, and we have the P200 model, which have a larger internal lumen of 200 micrometer. The device length is 2.64. And simply, the main difference between trabeculectomy and express shunt is that we actually do the same trabeculectomy steps, except that we don't do the sclerotomy. So when you dissect the flap, when you put your metamycin, when you irrigate after that, you will go with a 25 gauge needle, then you will insert the shunt 45 degree away from the cornea, so that you will avoid what? Yeah, touch and subsequent decompensation, right? But after that, you need to close the flap, okay, as any, as any regular trabeculectomy, but only the difference is that you will close it a little bit tighter, okay? You need to insert the, uh, the shunt very well. Don't allow it to be kinked or beveled. So it should be actually flat on the bed. Why, what's the reason of this? Why do you need to have it you know, completely flat? To avoid leak surrounding the, uh, the shaft itself. So you can do it actually express shunt surgery for any patients in which the target IUP is in the low teens or even single digit, open or closed angle. You should not use it in patients with moderate depth or shallow chamber unless it's combined with PECO. Why is that? Because it will be near to the cornea to cause corneal decompensation. You can use it in cases of moderate to severe glaucoma, no conjunctival scarring, patient of low risk for hypotony infection, and patients of poor tolerance to anti-glaucoma medication. The advantage that it has a lower risk of hypotony and shallow chamber compared with the classical trabeculectomy. Filtration flow is controlled. You have a flow restriction because of the internal lumen size, especially the P50, and you have a good flap you know, closure. You don't need to create a peripheral aridectomy, so will you induce the risk of inflammation after that. However, you have some certain disadvantages. It's still non-physiologic, so you'll still have the blip. You, can, uh, you still need to use the antimetabolites, so blip scarring is possible. The device can erode actually through the sclera if you don't have a good, you know, uh, flap thickness. It can actually cause corneal decompensation if there is corneal touch. It can cause actually sometimes chronic iritis. And you might have intermittent IUP spikes as well. So that's the video of uh, an express shunt procedure. So simply you will dissect as if you are doing regular trabeculectomy. Once you irrigate, you will go with a 25 gauge can, uh, needle, sorry. So you will go to the area between the white and gray zone. After that, you will go ahead and you will insert the express shunt. So you will go just a little bit oblique, then you will adjust it again 90 degree. So you need to push it very well. So now it's slightly you know, in a good position. After that, you need to close the flap, and here we have a tighter closer, uh, closure sorry, compared to trabeculectomy. The post-operative care is almost the same as classical trabeculectomy. Another glaucoma surgery include the non-penetrating glaucoma surgeries. In 1980, Vydorov, Kozlov, and Zimmerman took the next step in the evolution of glaucoma surgery by modifying the non-penetrating glaucoma surgery to have a scleral flap. So it started actually in the 1950s, but there was no scleral flap. The risk of complications was significant. However, in the 80s, they advised to have a scleral flap which actually minimized the post-operative complications significantly. When you talk about non-penetrating glaucoma surgery, we are talking about creating a trabeculodesmet window, full stop. So if you have a trabeculodesmet window, then that's a non-penetrating glaucoma surgery. You have three types. You have deep sclerectomy, you have viscocanalostomy, and you have the canaloplasty. Deep sclerectomy lower the rate of blip-related complications and hypotony. 
Uh, there are no single reports in the literature about deep-related endothelitis associated with deep sclerectomy, but there are very few reported cases of lipitis after deep sclerectomy. It's technically difficult, need expert surgeon, but the learning curve is actually short. So that was the initial saying when people start doing deep sclerectomy. They think it's very difficult, you need to have very stable hands, but actually once you do one or two or three cases, then you can run by your own. So actually saying that it's technically difficult, need expert surgeon, is completely wrong. Those who are familiar with trabeculectomy, they can definitely do deep sclerectomy. So in the hands of expert surgeons who have done, you know, 10, 20, 30 cases, they can actually have lower pressure to the same degree as trabeculectomy because they have wider exposure of the trabecular desmet window and therefore more filtration. So trabeculectomy is a common choice because of the surgical ease, because people think that it's actually technically more easier than deep sclerectomy, but at the end, the learning curve of deep sclerectomy is actually very short. So don't let this myth prevent you from doing deep sclerectomy. So, so this saying that experts in deep sclerectomy can do all non-penetrating glaucoma surgery, it's true. They can do viscocanalostomy, they can do canaloplasty, but remember that it has a short learning curve. So the indications of deep sclerectomy include primary and secondary open angle glaucoma, patients who are having high myopia, aphakia and pseudophakia with some concerns over aphakia. So why do we have some concerns over aphakia? So anybody can? Yes, other than the vitreous. So that's completely true. So the angle will be a little bit compromised after uh, having a fake, why is that? Iris. Not only the iris. So once you lose the zonular support, what will happen to the angle, the ciliary body? It will move forward, it will shrink. So the angle will shrink a little bit. You will have low-grade trabecular sclerosis going on. Uh, you can use it in, in cases of aniridia and anterior segment dysgenesis depending on your angle assessment. There are some relative contraindications which include narrow angle, with no associated cataract surgery, but if you have narrow angle and you are planning to go for a combined procedure, then you can go for deep sclerectomy as well. Why is that? Simply because you are deepening the anterior chamber. If you have peripheral anterior synechia away from the surgical site, especially or classically in patients with uveitic glaucoma, then you can actually go for deep sclerectomy. However, there are some certain absolute contraindications which include new vascular glaucoma and extensive peripheral anterior synechia. So any condition which cause extensive peripheral anterior synechia and close the angle superiorly, you cannot do for deep sclerectomy. It will simply fail. It will not work, actually. Steps are very simple, local anesthesia or even subtenor anesthesia. Remember that you are not doing peripheral aridectomy. Traction suture as well. You can do it, you know, um, you can put it actually in the cornea near the limbus, or you can put a bridal suture under the superior rectus tendon. You will have your conjunctival peritomy, either fornix or limbal based, preferably the fornix based. You will dissect the tenon, cauterize, do your superficial scleral clap, 4x5 or 5x5. Five five. Use your antimetabolite, then irrigate, do your paracentesis, and why should we do a paracentesis in deep sclerectomy? Because you want to decrease the pressure, especially in patients who are having very high IOP before the surgery. You want to decrease the pressure, so once you dissect the deep flap and go near the trabecular dismet window, it will not rupture. Okay? You will just dissect the deep scleral flap just above the choroid, expose the slim canal, trabecular desmet window, then de roof the canal. Then you will excise the deeper flap, and after that you will close the superficial flap. Remember in deep sclerectomy, you will close it loosely. In viscocanalostomy or canaloplasty, you will close it tightly because you don't want blip in these two procedures, but you have blip in deep sclerectomy. You will close the conjunctiva water tightly, and then you will give your subconjunctival injection. So just... Uh, to show you the procedure here. So the initial steps are actually the same as trabeculectomy. So there is no difference at all. You will dissect the superficial scleral flap, put your metomycin. After that, you will irrigate. If you have associated cataract surgery, you'll go ahead and do it. After that, you will dissect the deep flap until you reach the trabeculodesmet window. After that, you will excise the deep flap and you will close the superficial flap. Then you will close your conjunctiva. The post-operative care is simple, but it needs more frequent visits than trabeculectomy. So what's the reason? So 
that's one. Because you, you might need, you know, a closer follow-up because the need of the laser procedure like gonipuncture. Exactly. So the post-operative assessment consists of checking the visual acuity, IOP leak, and blip configuration, anterior chamber depth, and posterior pole examination. Can you have choroidals with deep sclerectomy? Definitely, you can have. Topical antibiotics and steroids, atropine, plus, minus. If you have perforation, if you have uveitis patient, if you have patients in which you have done PI after perforation or penetration, then definitely you need to give atropine to the patients. Those who are having very high intraocular pressure preoperatively, definitely you need to give them atropine uh, postoperatively. The complications you have, you can have moderate hypotony with deep anterior chamber. You can have transit, cystoid macular edema, as well in, as in trabeculectomy. You can have high IUP, and in this condition, you can treat it with laser suture lysis or gonipuncture if you have tight flap. Blood at the scleral lake with high IUP, so it needs a few days to clear. Rupture trabecular displacement window and iris prolapse blocking the filtration site. You need to revise or to convert to uh, penetrating deep, uh, deep sclerectomy if it's intraoperatively. If it's postoperatively, how can you manage a prolapsed iris through the trabecular displacement window? Huh? Yeah, if it's very early, you can give pilocarbon. After that, if it doesn't work, then you need to revise it surgically. Okay? Prefrontal synechia, laser iridoplasty, or laser synecholysis. You can do it if you have a chronic shallow anterior chamber in a patient who missed the follow-up. Dismet membrane detachment. It can happen after deep sclerectomy. So why is that? Other than traumatic. Because of the misdirection of the aqueous toward, toward the dismet. Okay? You can have scleral ectasia. If severe, you need to put a patch graft. And the presence of scleral ectasia can happen classically mostly in children. Okay. Canaloplasty, it's indicated in patients with open angle glaucoma. So can you do it in patients with narrow angle? The answer is no, definitely no. Patients with extensive prefrontal sinica, the answer is definitely no. Contraindications, neovascular glaucoma, chronic angle closure, angle recession, narrow angle, but if no associated cataract surgery, of course. Narrow approach with plateau iris. Previous surgery would prevent 360 degree uh, catheterization of the Schlem canal. It's considered a relative contraindication. You can do it for patients who are having, a th who need a target IUP in the mid-teens with open angle. Narrow if combined with FACO, mild, moderate, and severe glaucoma can be candidates for canoplasty as well, especially if you need the pressure again in the mid-teens. It can be done in patients with high risk for hypotony or infection or high risk for developing postoperative complication. So the steps of canaloplasty are almost the same as in uh, deep sclerectomy. So once you deroof the Schlem canal, after dissecting the deep flap, you will prime your catheter and you will insert it 360 degree. Then you will retract it and you will tie a nine or 10 oproline suture on the catheter tip. Then you will withdraw the catheter, and while withdrawing the catheter, you will ask your nurse to click on the plunger every two o'clock hours so that a high molecular weight OVD or viscoelastic material will be uh, dispensed in the Schlem canal. So it will help inflating or distending the Schlem canal. And after you withdraw the catheter completely, you will tighten the suture so that you will stretch on the Schlem canal. Then you will close the flap tightly. So what you will gain from having this suture inside? Hmm? So that's the suture inside. So, and that's the suture again. So we don't have blip after canaloplasty. So that's a suture. What's the function of this suture? Yeah, so it's distending the Schlem canal, preserving the Schlem canal, as you mentioned. So it works like, you know, a prolonged pilocarbon effect, right? So once you tighten the canal, what will happen to the pores of the trabecular meshwork? They will distend, they will enlarge, and they will function again. So the postoperative care, you need to, sorry, that's the wrong one. So the advantage is you have 360 degree treatment. You will have a circumference, you know, flow through the Schlem canal. It can be converted to deep sclerectomy by doing what? Suture lysis or even trabeculectomy by doing gonipuncture or doing needling simply. The disadvantages, it's technically difficult, but does it need expert surgeon to do it? 
So do we need expert surgeon to do it? The answer is no. If you can do a trabeculectomy, you can do whatever your non-penetrating glaucoma surgery. You need only very few cases to learn non-penetrating glaucoma surgery. One of the disadvantages is the, of the disadvantages of, of uh, canaloplasty is that it's really time consuming and it's a little bit expensive. The complications of canaloplasty that can occur, micro hyphema and hyphema, early elevated IUP within the first three months, you can manage it by gonipuncture or laser suture lysis. You can develop a blip at 24 months and remember that we will close the flap tightly so we don't need the presence of blip in canaloplasty. You will have late elevation of the intraocular pressure more than three months postoperatively. You can have wound hemorrhage, desmet membrane detachment, suture extrusion through the trabecular meshwork, hypotony, and you can have sometimes intracorneal hematoma or bleeding, which is refluxing from the Schlem canal going in the predesmet space. Okay. Another glaucoma surgery that can actually effectively lower the intraocular pressure is the glaucoma drainage devices. We have two types. We have the, the valved and the non-valved glaucoma drainage devices. The valve contains an internal mechanism to control the outflow of the aqueous humor and they drain once threshold IUP is reached, thus pre preventing postoperative hypotony. Each device has different flow restriction method and the non valve they do not contain a mechanism within the device. They relay on fibrous for, uh, blip formation on the end plate which will provide sufficient resistance to the outflow and control the IUP. So you need a ligation suture or you need actually to suture the tube in the non-valved glaucoma drainage devices while inserting it to the anterior chamber. While in the valve, you don't need to do so because of the internal mechanism. Few, a few studies have compared one implant with the another, and there are no clear long-term advantages of one implant over the other. The famous one is the Ahmed versus Berber study. We can use the glauc glaucoma drainage devices in a previously failed filtering surgery in patients who are having high myopia in aphakic patients and pseudophagic patients with diabetic glaucoma, ICE syndrome, congenital glaucoma with iridocorneal dysgenesis, glaucoma post-keratoplasty, neovascular glaucoma, and severe conjunctival scarring in which your filtering surgery is expected to fail. We have different types of the glaucoma drainage devices. We have the Ahmed implant, Cropin, Multino, and the Bervelt. In the Ahmed implant, we have also different types, the S1, 2, and 3, and we have the FP7, which is the silicon one, and it's biocompatible. So the Ahmed implant, we have two types, the polypropylene plate and the silicone plate. The silicone is flexible. It's more biocompatible, which will induce less inflammation subsequently, reduce the thickness of pseudocapsule, and subsequently lower the long-term uh, long intraocular pressure. While the polypropylene plate, it will be more rigid, it's therefore less biocompatible, and will induce more inflammation. It will subsequently increase the thickness of the pseudocapsule, and you will ultimately have higher intraocular pressure. Doing Ahmed implant is very simple. Traction suture, as we mentioned previously, conjunctival periotomy should be fornix or limbal based. Dissect the tenon capsule, cauterize. You can use sometimes antimetabolites. If you don't use them, it's fine. You need to prime the tube using BSS, and this is a very important step. Why is that? Because if you don't prime it, the internal you know, mechanism will not work. So the leaflets will not open. And we are talking here about the Ahmed implant. We need to fix it to the sclera using proline suture and creates clear tunnel to the anterior chamber or posterior chamber using 23 gauge needle. Patch graft after fixing the tube, you can use pericardium or you can create a scleral flap or you can use cornea preserving glycerin. But after of course dissecting the corneal tissue because it will be a little bit bulky. طيب. So you can use pericardium, scleral uh, flap, sclera by itself, okay, corneal glycerin. Then you will close the conjunctiva and you, go, you give your subconjunctival injection. So um, simply you will have your traction suture, you will dissect the conjunctiva, then you will create a pocket posteriorly. If you need to put metamycin, you can put it. You need to prime the uh, Ahmed implant, then you need to insert it 8 or 10 millimeter away from the limbus. The minimum accept is 8 millimeter. Then you need to fix it tightly to the, uh, to the sclera. After you fix it from both holes, you need just to move it and look if the globe is moving with you or not. If the globe is moving with you smoothly, then it means that the fixation is good. And after that, you need just to trim the tube and create your tunnel, go to the anterior chamber parallel to the iris and insert the tube inside the anterior chamber. Make sure it will go parallel to the iris. Then you need to fix the tube to the sclera. 
to avoid, you know, the tube moving inside the anterior chamber. If you have cornea and glycerin, you need to dissect it. Then you will fix it to the, uh, to the episclera and cover the tube. After that, you will close the conjunctiva and remove your bridal suture. The post-operative care is almost the same as trabeculectomy. Regarding the complications, just we'll go over them briefly. You have early complications post-operative, which include hypotony. The main reason is the leak from the tunnel. So remember, when you go to create your tunnel, sometimes you might go through the iris. Then you elect to change your mind and choose another tunnel. Uh, don't forget, while forming the anterior chamber, to check for the old tunnel. If there is a leak from it, then you can close it. Preferably, if there is a leak or no leak, you should close it. Okay? You might have choroidal effusion or hemorrhagic. The patient will come with pain as well. You have tube block with high IUP. And you might have actually a non-functioning tube, especially if you forget to prime the tube while doing your Ahmed implant surgery. You can have iritis if the tube is tucking on the iris. You might have high femur, shallow or flat anterior chamber, aqueous misdirection, vitreous hemorrhage, instability of the tube, and corneal lens contact with shallow chamber. You might have late postoperative complications, which include uh, plate encapsulation, high IUP, diplopia, which is the Brown syndrome, plate immigration to suprachoroidal space, exposed tube, corneal decompensation because of the tube touching the corneal endothelium, so it should be parallel to the iris, laying over the iris and away from the cornea. You might have cataract if the tube is too long and touching the lens, and you might have chronic iritis if the tube is tucking the, the iris. TVT, what does it mean? Tube versus trap study. So they compared actually the tube versus trap. They looked at the early postoperative complication, late postoperative post complication, cataract surgery, and reoperation for surgical complication. And it was the early postoperative complications were actually a little bit lower on the tube side compared with trabeculectomy. However, the late postoperative complications were almost comparable in both groups. Cataract surgery required was almost comparable, and the reoperation re for surgical complication was almost comparable. Now we talk about external cycloablation. We have two methods, transcleral diode laser cyclophotocoagulation and cyclocryotherapy. In transcleral cyclophotocoagulation, the mechanism is simply that we'll use an 810 nanometer diode laser with lower scleral transmission than the NDEAG, which was used before but greater absorption by melanin in the ciliary body pigment epithelium. You will go 1 to 1.5 millimeter away from the limbus. You will set your power between 1,500 and uh, 3,000 milliwatt, and you will use a duration of 1,000 to 1,500, and you will spare the 3 and 9 o'clock position to avoid significant pain postoperatively. On the other hand, in cyclocryotherapy, you will, have, you will damage the epithelium, vascular, and stromal elements of the ciliary body. The freezing will be minus 60 up to minus 80, which will produce minus 10 degree uh, temperature in the ciliary body, which is necessary for cell necrosis. You will go 1 to 1.5 millimeter away from the limbus. You will use minus 80 for 45 to 75 seconds. It will be one spot every one clock hour, 180 degree. The issue with cyclocryotherapy that it has unpredictable results. So you might result in thysis all of a sudden. So the indication of external cycloablation is patient with poor visual potential, failed previous surgery, surgery at high risk of failure, extensive conjunctival scarring, patients with OCP, ocular secretion of pemphigoid, or patients who are unable to undergo filtering surgery because of medical reasons. <coughs> Complications after external cycloablation include pain, iritis, macular edema, loss of two or more, sorry, loss of more or uh, one uh, line of visual acuity, persistent hypotony, and thysis, especially with cyclocryotherapy, Transit flat into the chamber with hypotony and choroidal, scleral thinning, malignant glaucoma, high femur, vitreous hemorrhage, and sympathetic ophthalmia. On the other hand, we have the UCP, which is the ultrasound ciliary plasty, which uses high intensity focused ultrasound through six piezoelectric transducers. This will spread around the circumference of the globe, and the device will come in three sizes either size 11 cone or 12 or 13 to adapt different shape sizes of the eye to enable accurate targeting of the ciliary body and preserve the adjacent tissue. So the position cone with suction ring to ensure proper positioning of the probe on the eye, you will insert first the suction ring, then you will initiate the vacuum, which will read 225 millimeter of mercury to stabilize the globe after giving local anesthesia. Then you will insert the ultrasound probe and you will initiate the six zone treatment. 
So it will target the ciliary body epithelium, and it will it will actually induce heating of 70 to 90 degrees within the ciliary body epithelium. You will have six zone treatment. You will spare the nasal and temporal part because the the distance actually between the treatment zones will be actually 70 degrees. So you'll spare the nasal and temporal quadrant, and you'll save them for treatment again in case the pressure is not decreased to a satisfactory level. So what you need to do here simply is to apply the cone <coughs> centrally. After that, you will apply the ultrasound blow, uh, probe. You will fill it with BSS so that you will allow the ultrasound actually to go toward the ciliary body. The treatment will take two minutes and 54 seconds approximately. After that, you will drain the BSS again and you will remove the cone. There are some certain complications associated with UCP or ultrasound ciliary plasty, which will include pain, transit conjunctival hyperemia or hemorrhage, cells or activity in the anterior chamber, especially in patients with uveitis, dry eye with punctate keratitis, corneal edema, sometimes corneal ulceration if the conjunctiva is dry, sorry, if the cornea is dry, transit postoperative hypotony with choroidal detachment, macular edema, scleral thinning sometimes can happen and change individual acuity, especially in PECIC patients of one or actually sometimes can reach to two lines. An incisional cycloablation procedure include endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation, which was first described in 1992 by Uram. The advantage of the endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation compared to transcleral and cyclocryotherapy and ultrasound ciliary plasty is that you will have direct visualization of the ciliary body. You will have more targeted tissue treatment with decreased energy level, and you will have fewer postoperative complications. So the laser unit for the endoscopic cycle photocoagulation contains an 810 uh, nanometer diode laser, pulsed continuous wave energy, and a 175 uh, watt xenon light source with helium uh, with the laser aiming beam and recordable video camera imaging. All four elements uh, are transmitted via fiber optic. Uh, or fiber optic to an 18 or actually now 20 gauge probe that will uh, be inserted in the int uh, intraocularly after forming the anterior chamber and after inflating the sulcus to visualize the ciliary body and the ciliary process subsequently. So the optimum focus for the laser is 0.75 millimeter from the probe tip and the endoscope provides 70 degree field of vision. The main unit is compact and portable. It's very handy, very easy to use and the maximum power output is 1.2 watts. So usually you will start by using 0.2 and you can increase it to 0.4 and 0.6. So when you compare diode laser with YAG and argon laser, and when you compare it in, uh, by looking at the absorption by million enriched ciliary body epithelium, you will see that the absorption is more with the diode laser. The energy required subsequently for treatment is less. That's why we use diode laser and ECP. And the stromal co 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 cognitive necrosis is less in diode laser. Therefore, you have less you know, chance of having hypotony. Pigment dispersion and bubble formation doesn't happen in diode laser compared with YAG and argon. And the tendency to undertreat is therefore almost obsolete in diode laser compared with YAG and argon laser. But there is a certain condition in which we might have tendency to overtreat in cases of excellent sodium exfoliation glaucoma. So you need to select patients in which the target IUP is in the mid-teens, those with open or closed angle, you can do for both of them endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation, mild to moderate glaucoma. You need to counsel the patient before going for ECP for severe cases. You should avoid it in inflammatory conditions such as uveitis or in patients with very significant pseudo exfoliation deposition on the ciliary body because you need to actually increase the energy more and more and therefore you will induce what? damage to the blood aqueous barrier and chronic inflammation after that. You can do it with cataract surgery, pseudophakia, or patients who are aphakic. You can do it in patients with failed previous filtering surgery, and you can do it in patients with plateau iris syndrome. And actually, the best response that you will ever have is in patients with plateau iris syndrome and patients with primary angle closure. So why the result in patients with primary angle closure combined with cataract surgery will be better than primary open angle glaucoma? Theoretically, what's the reason? Hmm? Exactly. And subsequently, once the ciliary body you know, or the ciliary process contract, you will actually help to deepen the angle a little bit. 
So it's a very easy to perform. You need to have a ten temporal corneal incision or nasal if you want to treat 360 degree. Inflate the anterior chamber and the sulcus. Visualize the ciliary process over the bag or through the bag. You can have a second incision if you want actually to treat 360 degree. You can start using 0.2 or 0.25 watt continuous mode and avoid popping because you are over treated if you have popping. You can have a straight or curved uh, probe. You can adjust the illumination to visualize the ciliary body and the aiming beam, which should be adjusted at or fixed at 100. And currently, the desirable treatment is 360 degree to have a prolonged IUP lowering effect. So it's a very simple procedure. The end point will be whitening and shrinkage of the ciliary body. So you can do it in a continuous mode. It's very easy to perform, but avoid white, uh, sorry, avoid popping because you are over treating the ciliary processes. So this is just a small graph showing, uh, showing us the significant reduction in the intraocular pressure, but it's on the expense of actually maintaining the same number of anti-glucoma medication. That's why in patients with severe glaucoma, you need just to counsel your patients about this thing. If the main problem with the patient is that he cannot tolerate the anti-glucoma medication, then you need to explain to him that you can actually reduce the number of anti-glucoma medication, but on the other hand, the pressure will be in the mid or higher teens. There are some certain post-operative complications that could happen after endoscopic cyclophotoagulation, mainly IOP spikes, which can reach 14%, anterior chamber hemorrhage, you can have cystoid macular edema, and you can have acute graft rejection if done in patients with penetrating keratoplasty. The advantage of ECP over TCP, as we mentioned before, that you have direct visualization of the ciliary process, more targeted tissue treatment, decreased energy treatment level, you will avoid collateral tissue damage, and you will decrease the postoperative inflammation and decrease the risk of complications. This is just you know, a small comparison in the vascular and histopathologic changes between endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation and transcleral dyed laser cyclophotocoagulation, which was described by Lynn. And they compared ECP and TCP groups with the control group, where all the groups underwent endoscopic fluorescein and geography immediately post-treatment, one day, one week, and one month. And they have actually checked for or looked for the perfusion and found that in immediately after the treatment that the perfusion was severely reduced, while on the first week and uh, first month, there was some perfusion compared with severely reduced perfusion and greater perfusion in the ACB compared with severely reduced perfusion. Therefore, the risk of prolonged hypotony or the risk of thysis with ECP is almost obsolete. But it can happen sometimes. There are few, very few reported cases. So this graph show you actually the perfusion after doing ECP and TCP one month and one day. And these are the morphological changes in, uh, in the ciliary processes after doing transcleral cyclophotocoagulation and endoscopic cyclophotocoagulation. Just we we'll need to skip this. So the advantages of ECP, low risk of hypotony and inflammation compared with transcleral dyed laser cycl uh, cyclophotocoagulation. It can be used at any point in the disease, easy to do, so it doesn't need skills at all. So um, if you are an anterior segment surgeon, you can do it. So it's, huh? You can do it in apicic, apicic, pseudophicic. There are some, there is, I think, I came over one report, but I haven't done it before. So I'm not sure if you can actually injure the lens or not. So it's very easy to perform, actually, ECP. And it can give you good results, actually, in certain selected cases, OK? So the disadvantages, it's non-physiologic, still cyclodestructive. It can induce inflammation. It's an intraocular surgery. It can, it can induce IUP spikes. So be careful about patients with total cupping, or patients with very advanced disease. Uh, just we'll come over this very fast. Uh, so when you talk about the eye stint, it's a small titanium stint implanted through the trabecular meshwork to the Schlem canal. You will have direct connection from the anterior chamber to the canal. You can use it in patients in which the target IUP is in the mid-teens, open angle, mild to moderate glaucoma, those who are tolerant to glaucoma medication because they might need the glaucoma drops after that. However, significant number of them, they don't need it. Those in which the conjunctival scarring uh, is present and they are at high risk for hypotony and infection, 
you can use actually the iStent for them, it's a good choice. So it can restore the physiologic pathway, it can spare the conjunctiva, and you have a clear corneal approach, plus minus FACO in patients who are FACIC, pseudo-FACIC, or FACIC, you can use iStent for them as well. The disadvantage, that the opening is limited to the size of the stent. So there is only single opening here, and access to the Schlem canal is circumferentially limited compared with, compared with the cypass and other procedures. So we have trabeculotomy ab interno, or the trabectome. It's an internal approach. You have electrocautery device, which ablates section of the trabecular meshwork, unroofing the Schlem canal and outflow collector channels. You can use it in patients in which the target IUP is in the mid-teens, open angle, mild to moderate <coughs> glaucoma. Those who tolerate glaucoma medications because you might need to use it postoperatively. Those in which they have conjunctival scarring and high risk for infection, no problem. You can actually use for them the trabectome. And it's, it's actually a very simple procedure as well. You need just to have an opening in the anterior chamber. Do your paracentesis, inject viscoelastic. But the issue is that you need to tilt the patient head, then to tilt the microscope to have good, a good visualization of of the angle. So after that, you can visualize the angle very well. Then you will induce or introduce or your, uh, your trabectome probe and you will ablate the angle subsequently. So it can restore the physiologic pathway, opens a continuous pathway from the anterior chamber to Schlem's canal and cautery removes the tissue to prevent closure and it spared the conjunctiva and it's a clear corneal approach which can be done with cataract surgery as well. However, there are some certain disadvantages like uh, clift formation, cyclodialysis clift, and access to the Schlem canal is circumferentially limited as well. You don't have a 360 degree access to the, to the Schlem canal and you can have a cyclodialysis clift. Uh, this video is not working. Okay. Another complications include uh, Dismet membrane injury, if you are not careful, ciliary body injury, zonular injury, reflux bleeding, and cyclodialysis clift and hypotony as well. So I'll stop at this uh, moment. Thank you very much. Any questions, please? So that's the, uh, that's the cyclodialysis clift. You can see the communication between the anterior chamber and the suprachoroidal space. So it will come on the other side. So you can see the opening here. So that's the cyclodialysis clip that the patient is having after trabectome surgery. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Dr. Faisal? Um, just I have a question, Doctor. Uh, what are yes. the, the indications of uh, UCP? I mean, in which patient will go for UCP as a first? Well, it's, uh, it's still one of the cyclodestructive procedures. So, but it has, you know, target or it targets the ciliary body epithelium. So the, uh, the side effects occurring with UCP compared with TCP, for example, or cyclocreotherapy are a little bit less. But for me, the indication at the time being, you can use it for mild or moderate glaucoma. You can use it for severe glaucoma as well. But still we are in the process of evaluating the outcome of UCP. Till now, it's not clear if we can actually effectively use it in advanced glaucoma, those with very high intraocular pressure as an alternative to glaucoma filtering procedure. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Faisal. Uh, in patients uh, in whom trabeculectomy and deep sclerectomy is indicated, you will go for deep sclerectomy. Or okay. there are some, uh, for example, factors that will motivate you to go to trabeculectomy. Well, uh, if you have the option to go for deep sclerectomy or trabeculectomy, definitely you will go for the least any invasive procedure, which is deep sclerectomy. You will go with a procedure which is actually causing less postoperative complication, although it needs frequent visits. So deep sclerectomy is a good option in this condition. However, in certain conditions, you are forced to go for trabeculectomy. And uh, these conditions include patients who have prefrontal sinica, which is expected to progress later on. Okay. <coughs> uh, 
I have no idea. Classically, uh, in each pack, you have two stints. So you can use both of them, one facing on the other side and the other the opposite. But I uh, don't have any idea how much pressure will be reduced if you use one or two stints. Uh, we, we choose the type of operation for glaucoma patient according to the target IOB. The question target is IOB the target the, IOB. And the mechanism of glaucoma as well. The mechanism of glaucoma. But I, I, uh, I mean the target IOB for my, uh, for my question. Uh, is there any mathematical way or fixed way to calculate the IOB, target IOB for a glaucoma patient? Like F, as if we are starting by 30% reduction of IOB in, uh, in, um, in most of glaucoma patients who started. Yes, uh, otherwise, uh, otherwise medically or, uh, or surgically. So is there any, any formula to use to, to uh, without any fallacies between uh, practitioners to fix the IOP, the target IOP for a patient? Like we add for each risk factors available, we can add percent. We start by 30 percent. We can add uh, any percent uh, over the 30 percent according to the risk factors available. Is there any fixed formula for that, sir? Yeah. Uh, regarding the fixed number for uh, for IOP, it's actually like a myth that we have created, and we believed in that we need a fixed number to take the pressure below it. Uh, but in clinical practice, or if you look at the literature, um, a magical number does not exist you can actually do three things which are very important for your patient and for your follow-up to your patient. You can do your OCT and, of course, check your central corneal thickness, and you need to check your visual field. If the pressure is significantly high, of course, you need to take the pressure down. So there, there is no doubt about it. Your initial step, if the patient is having a pressure in the 40s or 50s or 30s, you should take it below the 20. So that's an, a first step to start with. But after that, you need to monitor your patient and to check, does he have an advanced cupping or not? If a patient is having a pressure of, let's say, 20, for example, and he's on combination therapy, but his disc is having 0.4 cupping, then his target pressure is different than a patient who is having total cupping on a combination therapy, and his pressure is 20 as well. So if this patient, for example, who's having a cupping of 0.4, for example, is having a progressive visual field loss, and the progressive loss of his nerve fiber layer and OCT changes. And another patient is having the same pressure but with no loss at all. He doesn't progress at all. So you'll treat each patient differently. So setting a number actually is not, you know, it's not, you know, a practical thing to do. So you need to take each patient individually and follow them up with, with your visual uh, according, according to the available risk factors. The risk factors. Yani I, I estimated roughly in my uh, routine practice, I estimated by start by 30% mm -hmm. for non-risk factor. Uh, yani newly diagnosed, mm -hmm. I start by reduction of 25 to 30%. What do you mean by risk factor? The risk factors... Uh, 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 if you talk, of course, you know... Optic disc problems, optic disc problems, field problems, uh, uh, increased coronal sickness, uh, fee family history, mm -hmm. uh, fee... Uh, uh, previous surgeries, failed surgeries, something like that. For each, for each risk factor, I, ca I can increase roughly. I can increase 5% to 10% increase. Yeah, that's why you need to take each patient individually. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, okay. thank you, sir. You're welcome. Okay, thank you.
I just wanted to check the Hello, good afternoon. It's, it's gave me a great pleasure to, uh, uh, today to introduce our speaker, Dr. Rajiv uh, Henrikar from the Research Department, Chief of Ophthalmology, uh, Epidemiology, uh, and Low Vision. He is uh, going to give us a talk about low vision and the importance of that. Low vision care as a specialty in ophthalmology. As this is nowadays, it's not that being yani, taking our attention. Uh, uh, Dr. Rajiv is trained by WHO in Hong Kong in low vision care, and uh, he had an instrumental uh, effort in establishing low vision services in Oman, and uh, conducted low vision training workshops at Indonesia, India, Yemen, Oman, and Nepal, and he's been inviting the speakers in low vision in many uh, international uh, conferences and prepared low vigence in King Khalid Eye Species Hospital, Manuel. Uh, in the same time, he's having more than seven indexed uh, publications in low vision rehabilitation. So I would like you, Dr. Um, Rajiv, to give us your experience in this part, please. Thank you, Dr. Hassan. Basically, in this presentation is to introduce you to a new subspecialty which is, to some extent, neglected. So, I will first introduce what is low vision rehabilitation. You know, we and the clients both are running with the time to provide good eye care services. And this eye care services can be timely provided only if we pay attention to the three legs or three pillars of eye care, curative, preventive, and rehabilitative. To my limited exposure to Saudi Arabia, I have found that the legs which are running the curative component are very strong and solid, but to some extent, the rehabilitative component and the pre preventive components are like polio legs. So we can't run the race, especially when ophthalmology is now has been diversified, and there are so many subspecialties as far as security services are concerned. So today what I will try to do is not focus on the preventive services, but rehabilitative services which is part and parcel of eye care services. The aim of rehabilitative services is to improve the quality of life so that the person with a disability leave the life with dignity. He increases the self-confidence and less and less become dependent upon other people. Evidence has shown that it reduces the mortality and morbidities among the disabled people. They start contributing to the society positively and become less and less financial burden on the society. Rehabilitation is a wide subject and a two years training as far as super speciality is concerned. I'm going to touch only one component which is related to our day-to-day -day services and that is low vision disability. 
often we come to a situation when we are giving care in the clinics that we have to say patients and their parents sometimes that sorry we cannot do more than this there is no treatment for disease or perhaps we say that genetic engineering is in the horizon and maybe we will do something in coming years but one professor in USA had written an editorial after he himself had suffered from low vision and he had gone from one place to another place seeking help of the ophthalmologist and everybody had said the same thing sorry we don't have any care for you this guy retired then somebody suggested him to go to vision therapist he joined the services again and in the editorial he wrote to ophthalmologists that you people are myopic you don't know anything what is happening beyond your circle there is lot we can do for low vision disabled people so please take help of the experts who know about what to do with them as far as we i care professionals are concerned what we can do we must know what is low vision care and who are our clients we accept that we know and our medical education has given us very little information about rehabilitation of low vision disabled whenever we get chance we take initiative it's not a single person's work so we work as a team we encourage both clients their caregivers as well as the decision maker to facilitate the services provision for rehabilitation some of ophthalmologists are fed up with surgeries or doing work for a long time of a similar routine or maybe because of age some ailment does not allow them to do surgeries as they were doing in the past maybe they should consider as taking these as a philanthropic or community oriented service and continue giving ophthalmic services in the form of low vision rehabilitation research is always a component of services and that's why whatever the evidence based information we get we disseminate and use it as a tool to advocate for those who can spare their resources for the good of this disabled people this is a chart which shows the human being are based on the visual function can be divided into normal sighted person which is majority of the component and in that corner in the left triangle i have shown absolute blind means there is no perception of light and where there is no possibility as far as current scientific information is available to do something for improving the life but a huge component is there between normal sighted and absolute blind which we call it low vision disabled they can be one eyed person and the fellow eye might be having some visual function derangement they are actually epidemiologically by who are classified as bilateral blind but they have residual vision and they don't want to be in the blind school so these are the people whom we can consider as low vision clients remember some of the normal sighted person we know all the cases of glaucoma with 66 vision want to act as normal and if their peripheral field of vision is gone they are actually not normal sighted they have difficulty in their day to day life and some of the other visual function being compromised they lag behind compared to the normal sighted person so they also are considered to be low vision disabled the terminologies have changed by time absolute blind were later on called as visual disabled then they were called as visually challenged and now they are considered and called as persons with special need so persons with low vision to understand this thing let us consider our visual apparatus in like a computer or a robot it is a receiving visual signal through eyes 
it is interpreting the messages which has signals which has got it in the occipital lobe and other part of the brain and then it gives command for taking the motor action be it to the ocular muscles or be it to other part of the body this is a standard first years ophthalmic picture showing that a long trek has to pass from retina to the occipital lobe and anything which can happen in the brain affecting this tract can influence or damage the visual functions so before we start talking about low vision disability and what we can do first few facts we have to remember that low vision is not a defective vision defective vision we usually use in our day to day work which can be corrected either by spectacles or by contact lenses or by refractive surgery and in some pathological condition by doing the treatment also the vision can be restored so they are not low vision disabled the second thing children who are in special need because of some other cerebral or hearing or other mental problems they have much much higher risk of having visual function derangement so they all must be thoroughly evaluated for visual function in even monocular disability in the eyes like congenital cataract even if they present at late stage we must take curative action because the residual vision which is there has been found to be really helpful with the guidance of low vision therapists to improve their quality of life and last but not least providing low vision care has been found to be significantly cost effective to the community so if we understand this thing then the main thing is what is low vision standard who definitions are given that a person is defined as having low vision who after refraction or medical or surgical treatment has best corrected visual acuity of 20 60 or less to light perception in better eye so we are talking about human being not individual eye and he has the potential to use this residual vision for his day to day work the revised definition used is say visual function derangement we are not talking about visual acuity alone now we are talking about different visual function which are altered and cannot be corrected or treated and the person has potential to use the visual residual visual function they are the person whom we should focus on if we want to do low vision rehabilitation so where are these people we see them daily in kkesh being a tertiary hospital advanced cases come over here limited services we give but still they we know that they have residual vision which is not amenable to treatment some patients are chronic patients coming from one place of eye care to another roaming around seeking help and trying to find out how they can improve their life 50% of the children in blind school are actually not absolute blind they have some residual vision and they are the potential candidate for low vision therapy children with other disabilities in deaf school or down syndrome society members all are potential candidate for low vision and some of them are at home because th their parents have lost hope and they are kept in the safe environment some of them are even in normal school and they themselves don't know that they are suffering from some visual function derangement there are two main groups in which low vision rehabilitation is given children and adult my favorite is children because they are like climbers you can mold them the way in which you want to mold and not adult who are stubborn stick and they want to do, don't want to change their attitude and habits easily the causes are of clinician's importance not for low vision rehabilitative service giver two types of 
services can be given, institution-based low vision services and community-based low vision services. We will focus initially on institution-based services because that is the goal of current administration in KKS to expand in coming years. So let us focus on how we can do it within an institution. Usually we ophthalmologists and eye care providers are dealing with patients who are coming with eye complaint and we assess their visual function in the form of visual acuity and in selective cases, field of vision. We evaluate anatomically the structure derangement which has taken place because of so-called pathology and do also the physiological evaluation, treat the condition and then finally in the follow-up we evaluate the impact of our services given. Whereas in low vision rehabilitation work, we assess the overall visual function and visual apparatus. We also combine the information which we get with other sensory organs information like hearing and IQ and then focus on identifying the strength and weakness of visual apparatus and based on that try to improve the daily living of the person with the help of giving them some adaptation skills. So if we want to shift from ophthalmic work to low vision work, one of my teacher of Pakistan had said rightly that you have to remove the cap of ophthalmologist and optometrist and start thinking and wearing the cap of a low vision therapist, then and then you can succeed because we are so much groomed to think in clinical side and eye side and even the tissue side. So what do the low vision care provider do? As and when client come, they listen, they observe, they assess, then they set goal along with the caregiver and the client, then guide them to reach this set goal and if required, provide some tools like low vision aids. Train the provider, uh, disabled person to use those aids and then reassess periodically. Once again, the cycle start of resetting the goal because if that goal has been reached, you, they may, there, we can think about other solving problems. And in this way, the cycle goes on till late age. So if a child is your client for low vision therapy, he will be your permanent client till the advanced age. But along with this, side by side, the low vision care provider counsel, encourage, and share the outcomes both with the caregiver as well as to their colleagues. So remember this three yellow side where we have a lot of potential of including research and counseling. So when client and their caregiver comes in the initial phase, in the discussion we have to be very clear that we are not ophthalmologists giving care at present as a treatment. We are here to assist, in, assist them in coping the limitation which they have in their visual functions and probably will try with their help to solve and overcome them so that they can live better. So that unnecessarily high hopes do not develop when they come for low vision rehabilitation. As you know that these people have already gone to ophthalmic services so frequently that they are passing through different stages of grief, as we all know, and based on that, so many times when we are meeting for the first time, this is the time for their sublimation. They go on cursing the ophthalmologist, they go on cursing their parents, or whatever is they think is responsible for their disability. We have to kindly listen to them, and then side by side, poking question, to gather the relevant information so that we can build up our case history as well as the required information which we can get it through history taking. In addition to that, always watch your client. I am talking about child everywhere if you see in the slide because I am more fond of doing low vision rehabilitation for children. So always 
talk to the child, uh, look at the child and observe what he is doing as soon as he comes in the clinic when you are talking with the parents also. Find out what are their main concerns because they are going to help you in setting your first goal. Is he having problem in the near vision, distant viewing, entertainment like watching TV, some problems in school work which is really problem for him. He has a mobility during daytime or mobility in the evenings or low illumination and some other problems like playing in the sports or specific sports, all these things. So after gathering the information, the next step which comes is we do visual function assessment. Now visual function assessment in low vision rehabilitation is to a great extent different than what we do it in our ophthalmic clinical practice. But the principles are same. That the visual image is having a form sense, color sense, and movement sense. So the tests are accordingly required for a visual acuity, contrast sensitivity, color vision, visual adaptation at different luminance, visual field testing, and motion perception. Where we should do these tests? The ideal place is where the children are comfortable. Either it is a center where they are being taken care or it can be outside ophthalmic unit but within the premises so that easy reference and diversion of the cases can be done. For adult, we do first testing is the distant vision testing. As far as low vision rehabilitation is concerned, we must focus on near vision test and that too also when we are dealing with children. Because then so their, their world and environment is very small. So this is how with a Lea symbol chart with a thread, we do the vision testing for near vision and we document all the recordings first with both the eyes to make the child comfortable and then if required, we can do it for individual eyes. Some children in pre-verbal stage are difficult to communicate. For them, we give this type of Lea puzzle at home under supervision of parents. They play at home and get accustomed to these four different symbols which are there and then they become very cooperative when we are testing it for near vision or distant vision. Preverbal stage or very young infants and neonates also can be tested quantitatively for visual acuity by having this Lea pedal test. These are the test of preferential looking, so more complicated instruments are not required. Just let the child sit in the lap of mother and you can do the testing and document the visual acuity. For distance vision, the light box and in that the Lea symbol chart or digital chart which are having ETDRS value for equal distance between the symbol. The difference between the Snellens chart and the, this chart is each symbol has its value. So we can document the progression of even one or two symbol improvement after some time when we are giving the low vision care. The same light box is used for having this. This is a 100% chart with the contrast of white to black. The next one which we are using is 2.5% contrast between backgrounds. These are the two extremes of contrast which we test as a screening. If the difference in the visual acuity in these two chart is more than three lines, the child is having contrast problem. Then we do another test with the help of either 25% chart which is available and we can with the three findings can plot a graph. This contrast sensitivity graph helps us in even identifying the disease without looking into the eye. In pre-verbal stage we can use this dolls of different grades of uh, contrast to identify if the contrast problem is there or not. The next one we do is color vision test. This is called 16D color test and 
once the child in the play situation under the supervision of the caregiver does this test we get this we get the results in the form of a circle and when we actually draw and connect it we can identify whether deuteran or triton type of color vision defect is there or not in this child the field of vision more central vision is important because this is really affecting the reading and writing so reverse emsler grid chart which is available in low vision kit can be used for identifying this problems the standard peripheral vision can be tested if the child is cooperative by goldman perimetry but other hand held arc perimeters also are easily taken from one place to another place when we are visiting the, their centers one test which we usually are not aware about is the motion perception we do visual acuity test very well a child performs but he has problems in mobility and when we tested this thing we found something which is unusual that the child cannot perceive the motion this test is a computer test which we do and if the child immediately shout kalb that means he can see the dog and his motion perception is normal any of this test earlier done visual acuity color vision field of vision contrast sensitivity if there are problems in this you repeat the test some children with other disabilities are having very short attention span so you may have to break up your whole assessment into two or three sessions but if you find that there are some derangements in this visual function then you must go for testing the higher visual function test also what are they as you see the impulses from retina up to the occipital cortex passes through various brain structures and it has been documented and found that if there is any damage in the conventional channel you can develop new channels which up till now were dormant and from parietal lobe if there is a problem because of some lesion then we can develop the optic message passing through temporal lobe also so it it's just a question of identifying what is the problem and how we can have alternative channels one higher function which is usually children are complaining when we are doing the visual acuity test it is normal but they complain that when they cannot read properly and fast if you want to test this problem this is a crowding phenomenon so lia symbols are brought nearer to each other at a 50% distance than the conventional one and we test again the visual acuity should be equal for near vision in normal chart compared to this chart but if there is a difference the child is likely to have problem of crowding of the text nowadays among brain the physiologist and ophthalmologist there is a consensus that autism is perhaps lack of visual function understanding in very early age this is the test by which you can find out whether the child is understanding different emotions or not and this is a easy test which we can do it in very young age some children are having problem of direction and mathematical geometrical figures these are the tests for them once we do the sensory functions then the next is motor function some therapists believe that the motor function should be done first and the sensory can be done later on but it doesn't make any difference as far as you do all the tests and document it properly so ocular movement uniocular and biocular when a ball is rolling or some motion is there and the child is looking at it we can look at the tracking there are some movements while reading or 
Regular movements which are taking place in eye during work are called saccades. Abnormal movements like nystagmus. We must also do the testing for accommodation in all children, especially the Down syndrome, because they have a big problem of late or non-existing accommodation development. How we can do it? Fix a toy or a picture of child's interest on the direct retinoscope and you do the retinoscopy while the child is looking at far and while he is looking at your retinoscope. Convergence test should be done and one more test which nowadays is very popular and that is estimating the speed of reading of the child by giving different standard form fonts which the child is using in class or in day-to-day -day work. Once you get the information about assessment, if required you repeat, you do it in, break it in session. Sometimes you may have to take help of the parents or caregivers and then we have to sit and discuss what are the strengths and the weaknesses of visual function of this particular child. Quantify it because you have now all assessment tools to quantify it and document it. Now the most important thing is we are groomed to think and document in our way. But the vision therapist and the client are interested in something else, using their visual apparatus in their day-to-day -day life. So there are four main components in which we are using our visual function for communicating and interacting, for orientation and mobility, for daily living activity like tying the shoes, putting on the clothes and other, and sustained near vision tasks like working on computer, looking at the mobile, reading and writing. The preference have changed. Earlier it was only reading and writing and now we are talking about looking at WhatsApp is a big problem child will tell you. Like Apgar score, like head injury score, there is a score which has been developed for assessing the low vision status of each disabled person. If he is acting exactly like a blind person, he is given one score. If he is acti acting like a normal sighted person, he is given two score. But if he is in between these two, he is given one score. So he is a low vision disabled for that particular component of visual function. So in this way, we have the score and based on the score, we can judge after asking at six months or 12 months to the caregiver, what is the performance improvement in this field? And perhaps we can have better impact evaluation of our caregiving of rehabilitation. So, when we are finished with assessment and setting our goal, then comes what we can do. For giving intervention, our goal is to develop compensatory skill so that the child can cope up with four visual components. Who can help? We all can help who are surrounding this disabled person. Teachers, parents, volunteers, special expert and low vision therapist. How? The same tool which we are using it for assessment can be used for training the child and enhancing their skill. And sometimes we have to give them the low vision aids. Two main components of interventions are there. The component which is very favorite and useful optometrists are interested in is optical aids and non-optical aids. But vision therapists are more import, are doing it as a lesser cost change in the environment to make it low vision friendly. If a child is unable to see whether father is mother there, lipstick color, putting a mustache, prominent makeup will help the child to differentiate between father and mother. The child at birth suppose is having problem of vision put him in small environment with a bright light so that visual stimulation takes place and other development takes place. Sometimes additional sound stimulus is also required to bring attention to the child. Flashing devices can be put near the child. 
changes in the computer nowadays is the most important low cost intervention which can make wonders for low vision disabled. Change the background color, increase the space between the fonts and increase the size of the font which automatically improve and the child will read write like a normal child. If you give milk or yogurt or porridge in a white saucer, the child is not going to do anything because he does not differentiate between the background. Simple change of black saucer will make wonders for his life. For all low vision disabled, the best is cap with the hood, irrespective of what type of disability or what type of underlying cause is there. So people earlier were saying that albinos need hair because the glare will come from other side. No, all low vision disabled are comfortable by using this cap. Small changes in the house to have a good contrast will also help in easy mobility in the known environment of this child. Stick usually is considered as a tool for absolute blind, but no, low vision disabled also can help. You may not require a white cane or something, but a tool, a regular stick also can be a helpful tool for them for appreciating the immediate near surrounding. What we use as pen here, marker pen is their main tool for using for reading and writing. Illumination is the main change which we can do it in their life. The working area can be illuminated properly. LED lamps are preferable because heat is not generated. Sometimes you have the lamp on the spectacle mounted devices. The next one is the filters. 80% of the children or 80% of the people with low, low vision disability are comfortable and accept the filter glasses. Which glass? We don't know. You just have to try different one and whichever is comfortable for them, one for indoor and one for outdoor should be dispensed to them. Remember, filter glasses are exclusively different categories than the sunglasses. If you give sunglasses to a low vision disabled, to some extent you are doing harm because it is not a substitute of filter glasses. All the rays of different wavelengths are curtailed and the retina thinks that this is now function of rods. It's night. And if there is already compromised function of rods, they become less sighted. So specific filtering of specific light amplitude only is essential for both roads and cons thinking that it is time for me to function. Even the houses and the windows can be covered with this type of acetate sheet which will give less light of specific amplitude and velocity. I'm not talking about the conventional loops uh, or conventional magnifiers which are discussed in the textbook and in optometry societies because they are now absolute. We are now in a new generation where this type of electronic magnifiers are reasonably cheap available and even you can use your smartphone for using it as a magnifier and use it for different reading and writing. These are for old people who are still interested in reading and people are suppose of age related macular degeneration just enlarging the size of the object will solve the problem and they can continue enjoying their hobbies. This old man is interested to drive because that is their main function in western countries and telescope is given and he is still holding the driving license and doing it easily without accident. For children for spot screening we can give monocular telescopes and that needs proper training. These are expensive but very useful low vision devices if parents can afford or if there are donors. These are the best thing because they are having both distant and near vision aids along with in one tool. So they are ideal for classrooms and for reading writing. In a very young child, this is a day one child, the main function of visual apparatus is communication. 
if the child cannot see properly, he cannot develop the skills of having different expression and mimicking mother or parent. So there is an entire new field of caregiving that is called early intervention. A child who has suffered from retinopathy of prematurity, a child who has congenital anomalies, CP or optic atrophy of childhood, parents sometimes do not know how to interact with this child. And if visual stimulus are not given in time in early age, then the brain and overall growth gets hampered. So that's why the specialists of early intervention are very essential for this family to interact with and get the counseling. Ladies and gentlemen, the training of low vision is not easy or the caregiving is also not easy because it needs a separate type of training than what we are getting in ophthalmology. But before starting for giving the care, you must always think about what I can give once I assess. Because ethically, it is not right to start low vision services without thinking about what optical aids or counseling you are going to give. So affordable low vision aids must be available for dispensing, maybe at free of cost or at low cost. Modern and acceptable to the child or the uh, disabled person should be in the inventory so that as and when they are going out of stock, you can get additional stock of it. All these people, 50% of them are getting lost to follow. If they are lost to follow up, that means your low vision services was not good. Otherwise, they will come. So judicious follow up is very important of these cases whom you have given care. These are the people who are working together in low vision care services. Client has almost 40% of the work to be done because they are going to cooperate with you as you suggest. Ophthalmologists have only 10% role to play. But it is very important because sometimes they or the optometrists are the leader of this team. But don't forget the patient, parents also, because parents have also a crucial role to play. You are there for half an hour to one hour with the child, and the rest of the time the child is with their parents. They can do all your suggestion more effectively at home circumstances. These are some of the important useful link if somebody wants to pursue for the reading as well as for the career in low vision rehabilitation. These are the places where further studies are, as far as I know, are available, but there are so many other places which I am not knowing. As nearest place I was knowing was three years back in Jordan, there were six to eight week courses of low vision were taking on, but Recently, I heard that they have discontinued it because of lack of candidates. So, low vision services requires patience. It's not like cataract surgery that within one minute or ten minutes you get dramatic results. It requires leadership, teamwork, and commitment. And what is the reward? I want to show you what is the reward in a small video, and then I will ask you one question. This is a very small four-month four child coming from neonatologist with the diagnosis of autism. Somebody suggested that he should be taken to low vision therapist. His mother is trying to bring attention to the child to her face, but child is not looking. So the therapist says, bring the hand across and maybe this will be bringing the attention to the child, but mother failed. She was frustrated because this is the same story which is going on in different clinics. Since the brother was wearing glasses, the vision therapist thought, let me enlarge the images of the surrounding. And the child, after four months, for the first time, sees the face of the mother and gives the social smile. If this video has brought smile in your face, on your face, or has touched your heart, 
you are the best candidate to start the low vision service. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Dr. Rajiv. Uh, very, very nice, informative uh, grand round about um, uh, uh, low visions. And uh, I'm sure that a lot of ophthalmologists, they have difficulty actually to uh, look for this field, which I think so it is an important subspeciality in ophthalmology and need to be looked, especially when you have uh, uh, handicapped people that they need your help. So I would like to open the floor for any questions. Okay. So I would like to ask you, what do you, how, how you would like to evaluate the low vision surfaces in our country here? If you look, is there any special place other than King Khalid that you can uh, mention for us? Starting low vision services in a tertiary eye hospital is the worst thing for parents and child because they are already having traumatic experience of dealing with we people. So it can be nearer to eye hospital but not within the premises. Second thing is this low vision friendly environment has to be created in the center because many of the children will come with wheelchair, they will need assistance, so there has to be a play area outside. So you need to have a separate place for establishing low vision care. As far as I know, there are two places in Saudi Arabia where certainly I know that this type of services are available. One was in Jeddah by one NGO, but recently I came to know that some problems are going on in that NGO. And second was in Mecca, some medical city is having a specially department of low vision care, which is a bright thing, and somewhere in Riyadh also, it must start soon. Okay, so this is one of the things that I think that we have national defects in providing our people who are having low visions with really a referral, a place where we can help, assist, and then we can guide them. Uh, I'm sure that if, in thought, if you don't have really real an assessment of these low vision peoples, uh, they will have difficulty in their career, either in the schools or later on in the... Uh, I notice nowadays yani, some of universities are starting to put yani, a lot of, you know, uh, 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 you know that subspecialities in education of low vision peoples, which is, could help to uh, help peoples. Uh, any further questions, please? Yes, Dr. Abdelaziz. Abdelaziz. Yes, you mentioned in your presentation that uh, this lesson is uh, uh, This is worldwide. The eminent pediatric ophthalmologist from UK in London School has given thesis to different students of different countries and when they visited the blind school for their thesis and paper, they found that absolute blind are learning the braille by touching, by remaining were reading the braille. That was the sentence which was used. That means they had residual vision which they were trying to use for looking at the surrounding, including the text of braille. And remember, braille is a very tough language to study. It's absolute now because of new gadgets which has come in computer. So maybe after our next generation will not see Blair, hopefully the Braille language. outcome. Basically, it's a very slow process. It's not rewarding financially also, because these are the people who might be having more than one family member suffering from this, and expensive gadgets are the, sometimes the solution for them. So if they don't have low vision resource center for providing the optical aids, it does not work well in the private sector. NGOs are the best solution for this. 
we charge from the patients or their caregivers but lowest possible because internationally there are centers from where you can bring low cost optical devices and give them at the similar rate because if you give them free they don't understand the importance of it if you give them with some charge they will maintain it in a better way in the western country it is there where we don't have the facility for assessment let's not talk about uh, provision of services as as uh, low vision aids from the beginning yeah. yes when we do assessment we must keep the things ready but in western countries low vision devices are part and parcel of the uh, insurance coverage so it it should not be difficult over here and these are under privilege group of the society so nobody will object to that ample of people are ready to donate for this type of work and philanthropic uh, people will come forward as soon as they see what you are doing it so do step by step little market it properly through proper person and you will see wonder because there is queue of people who want to donate for this type of cause i just want to have one more message to all residents and fellows in the research department of kkesh we have the assessment kits so for your thesis or for research projects if you want to utilize them you are welcome very few publications are there of this type of detailed assessment quantitatively for different visual functions this is a golden opportunity for you all who are dealing with this mono disability in eye by using this tools in easy way you can collect quantifiable visual functions thank you for attending this and this is this i think for the time for um, quiz and i would like to invite all of you to attend our case presentations today which are actually uh, some cases that really happened rarely and could help you to improve your uh, clinical skills to recognize these uh, cases thank you
بتقعد جنبي كده يعني I'll go down there ايه بس هتطلع لك صورة ده ايه اوكي طيب لا بس I'll go down yeah. okay and then how do I exit the door Assalamu alaikum. Um, I'm Dr. Manar. I'm an F2 fellow in oculoplasty. And um, I'll be giving you the quiz today. So we'll start with the first case. This is a 35 year old uh, male. He's complaining of this uh, lower lid lesion for the past, um, let's say, one year. Um, if you can have a look and uh, give a diagnosis. This is the first question. Just diagnosis. And the second question is uh, how would you manage this case? First question is the diagnosis. Second question is management of this case.
Okay. Yeah. Thirty-five. Yeah. No, no increase in size. Correction from Dr. Osama. It's been there for a long time. <laughs> okay, second case. This is a 20 year old male. He had an RTA um, five years ago and had a visceration with implant. Uh, he's on prosthesis in the right eye. Um, if you can mention three complications with a patient wearing prosthesis. In general, in general. Next case, this is the third case. <clears throat> this is a baby, 14 month old, um, had this uh, lesion since birth. Um, if you can mention first question, the diagnosis. The second question, management. And third question is treatment indicated for this case. Is treatment indicated for this case? Management. No, it's just, it's been there since birth, and now she's around 12, 14 months. No. Um, is management indicated for this case? Okay, 
fourth case. This is a child, let's say six-year-old child with abnormal features. If you can mention three features of the syndrome. Three features of the syndrome. And second question, uh, treatment, management. Treatment, management. Last case. This is a 50-year-old female. Um, she felt that she had uh, discomfort in the upper lid. They averted the upper lid. They found this, um, I'd say, fullness in the fornix or lesion in the fornix. Uh, she was not complaining of any pain and no change in size. She was just wondering what this is. So um, the first question, if you can give a diagnosis. You can ask uh, questions. Mm -hmm. Yes. I'm sorry? Push what back? The lesion? Mm -hmm. um, this is Dr. Sama wants just, uh, I, I tried to. And second, second question is management. First question is a diagnosis. Second is how would you manage this case?
Okay, so okay, time's over. <laughs> yes, okay. We just have the discussion of the cases. Okay, so let's talk about the first case. I asked, firstly, I gave you a brief history. I, I know sometimes it's not. Uh, with this brief history, um, what can you give me? What kind of diagnosis? I'm sorry? Okay, that's a differential. Basal, sorry? Okay, okay. And what would direct you towards a malignant or a benign? Okay. Do you see all that here? Okay. And the fact that I was wrong, I said one year, it's been there for, let's say, 15 years. Um, yes, very good. Yes, it is mostly um, interdermal. What's the difference between compound and interdermal? Okay. Okay, this is not pigmented, so it's an interdermal nevus. But the age. Okay, it's a nevus. But so what would be the management? Okay, and if the patient doesn't like this? Okay, shape biopsy, correct. Okay. This is the second case. This man is on prosthesis. We said, what are the three complications that people with prosthesis have? There are many, but uh, in general. 
ptosis okay 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 so what you can do is you can categorize you can say he can have recurrent inf infections he can have uh, inflammation with because of the chronic rubbing as a foreign body you can have papillary joint reaction you can have pgs and you can have structural problems ptosis ectropion entropion uh, socket contraction okay this is the third case. Also, uh, it's, a, it's a small child, and the parent said that this has been there since she was born. It increased a little bit. If you want more questions, no, it does not increase with, uh, if she's sick or with pressure. Um, little, they cannot tell the family. Um, so as a child and born with this, most the top differential would be? Okay, it's more like a capillary hemangioma, okay, because of the vascularization. Um, okay, and the management in general for a capillary hemangioma in a child? Amblyopia. Okay, and what other methods do you have of management? Masma, uh, sorry. Yes. Mm -hmm. Surgical mm -hmm. You can say again local, systemic. Okay, local. Local, yes. Intralegion and steroid injection. Okay. And systemic like uh, beta blocker like propranolone. Yes, and also there's another modality. We don't do it much, but. Uh, other than surgical? You said surgical, I'm sorry. Yes, yes. So local, um, systemic, and surgical. Okay, and would you treat this child if you see him? If it's bothering the family, uh, to be honest, it, it doesn't seem embryogenic, it doesn't cause any, any compression. It may resolve by age of seven years totally, so I would observe initially. Mm -hmm. So our, the thing we work with clinically is if it's affecting the vision. Yes. Okay. okay. This is a syndrome, or what is the name? This is okay, and what are the features? Right. And how would you treat surgically? If the mother said, I don't like the way he looks, I want to change. Okay. Dentosis, correct. It's, there's one step, some people two, say two, three step, but usually you will start with the medial canthus and address that, then dentosis. Unless it is causing amblyopia or he has a bad head posture, you would uh, start with dentosis. And the uh, last case. This is a good differential, yes. Yes, it's a dacryops. Um, fat prolapse, the lipodermoid or dermolipoma, and dacryops. Dr. Osama said, look at the color because it has a bluish hue, like a cyst. What is a dacryops? Extension from the lacrimal tissue without the skin. Dacryops. Ducks, yes, this is it. It's a cyst from the lacrimal gland duct. This is a dacryops, okay? And in this case, if the patient is not bothered, she saw it by accident, and she said, I don't know, what is this? Should I remove it, or? or? We should tell her that it's uh, safe, it's not harmful. It's from the main lacrimal or like the lacrimal? Could it be from the accessory, because it's not on the lateral side? The yes, the medial side. This is why it's um, not clear, not straightforward. Yes, go ahead. What would be the lining of the dacryops? Has to pathology. Cholamina. Okay, you can, it can be cuboidal to, not really columnar, uh, and you can have, you will have what, PS positive secretions inside. You can have some areas with elongated cells, uh, kind of cuboidal to columnar with some, um, uh, you know, uh, apical de decapitations as well. But in this case, uh, it's, I mean, I know it's described originally in the lacrimal gland. You know this. But in this case, we have documented dacryops. I'm sure Dr. Osama knows as well, in the eyelids. Uh, possibly, query, we, are, we studied them before, a long time ago, by Dr. Weatherhead, and they say it might be related to the trachoma uh, mm -hmm. because it's arising from other glands, not necessarily the accessory uh, lacrimal glands or the, uh, because it's far away here. So I would say this is an eyelid dacryops rather than one arising from the lacrimal gland. 
and uh, for the capillary hemangioma, what would you see? What type of, of, uh, of a lesion is it, histopathologically? It's a hamartoma, okay. What are you supposed to see? So it's capillary-like proliferation, yes, yes, capillary-like, but it's different than the appearance of the cavernous, okay, okay. Thank you, sorry for the interruption, okay. I couldn't no, no. resist. It's okay. <laughs> Yes, um, if, what would be the management if the patient is asymptomatic? Observation. Observation, correct. And if she is complaining, she's having fullness? Um, not aspirate, just try to excise. Okay, but this is. Yes. Thank you. This is it. Hello, we'll start the case presentation now so that we have time to finish earlier. So we can pray together after the presentations. We'll not talk time in this presentation, we'll make it brief, just uh, limited to the case informations. So, start. I didn't want to Shall we start, Dr. Hassan? Okay. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. This is uh, Abdullah Zahrani. Today I will present a uh, case uh, under supervision, uh, kind of supervision of Dr. Hassan al -Thibi. Uh, 56 uh, years old female, known case of uh, hypertension, presented with sudden decreased vision loss affecting both eyes for two months associated with headache. Uh, there is no history of fever, no cough, no joint pain, no TB contact. Uh, the past medical ocular history, uh, there is a hypertension for two months with no treatment, admitted before uh, for five days and received IV methylprednisolone followed by oral prednisolone 40 milligram and tapered to uh, 10 milligram per day. On examination, we can notice the right eye, uh, count finger, left eye, hand motion, an IOB within uh, control, 12, 16 for the left eye, uh, a lid uh, within normal limit, both eyes, a conjunctiva quiet, both eyes, a cornea, there is a faded uh, mutant fat, KBs, both eyes, an iris, there is a moderate depth with a plus one flare and cells, uh, both eyes, and there is broken synechia, and there is no iris nodule, both eyes. A lens, uh, a mutual cataract, we can notice this, and uh, this image. A fundus examination, there is a vitreous uh, haze plus one, with disc edema and choroidal detachment, both eyes. A uh, B-scan was done. And we can notice that both eyes, they have mild vitreous obesities and uh, peripheral choroidal detachment, 360. And there is a mild uh, subchoroidal obesities. And we can uh, notice the fused retinal choroidal layer thickening. 
and this is the OCT and FFA. We can notice in the OCT there is a choroidal fold and there is a subretinal fluid affecting also both eyes. And this is the FFA. We can notice also there is a uh, hypofluorescence uh, line uh, arising from the optic nerve. It is uh, in the diffuse matter. And this is the image and the OCT after treatment we can notice there is no disc edema and the OCT also uh, uh, the retina and choroid uh, uh, have the same uh, normal picture. So in summary, a 56 years old female known case of hypertension presented with sudden decreased vision, both eyes, for two months associated with headache. Al vision it was uh, count finger for right eye, had motion left eye, al IUB within normal. Uh, there is a faded M, uh, mutton fat KBs with moderate depth with plus one uh, flare and salt and with broken uh, posterior cyanica, there is no iris nodule. At lens it was a mature cataract, both eyes. The fundus examination, with the says plus one, discadema corroded detachment. So what are the differential diagnosis you think about it? Yeah. Ask this is the questions for... Uh, yeah, I put these oh, questions with uh, Abdullah Fikor. This is an important. So when you have case 56 years old and you have an existive RD, choroidal detachment, disc swelling, and not resolving information for more than uh, six weeks that being treated with systemic steroids. So do you have anything in your minds? Must create, okay, one. Good, Good. excellent. And pictures like what? Tuberculosis? Ah, not that too much. Another thing. PKH, excellent. Okay, anything else? Important. What's that? Indigenous. So let us to see what will happen with Abdullah. Yes. So our deficient diagnosis here, banyuviatis, we put it also in our deficient diagnosis. So this is the most anatomical, which is important to put ahead, and then you can follow it one by one. <clears throat> and also a typical VKH, as my colleague uh, said. Why we said a typical VKH? Yeah, the only thing, it's not that an obvious obsessive retinal that means the age of the patient is not really going with that, and patient treated with the systemic steroid and not improving too much, okay? So it's atypical, right? Yeah, it's not that obvious as we know that. Uh, 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 and I saw that you are highlighting, you know, with it bald, yeah, the posterior scars, why? Yeah, because it is the, the diagnosis of our case, posterior scleritis, we... Uh, Based on what? Yeah, because of uh, the image we can see, okay. and uh, also uh, there is no history of uh, like systemic disease, because there is 80% uh, uh, posterior scleritis is not associated with systemic disease. Yeah. If, if and you have to go the, back just to yes, that, sure. the photos that we had. Sure. Yeah, this is, might you say that the posterior scleritis should be presented with deep-seated vein, okay? Which is important, but in this case, this patient has been treated with steroids, so that might be masked the questions. Okay. Look for the choroidal faults. Almost we have subretinal fluids, okay? We have, even though if you look in the uh, uh, fluorescent angiography, there is deep-seated, you know, hypofluorescent line that radiating from the, uh, from the disc, which is really put it in your mind when you have something like that, think about, and looking for the ultrasound, they, what they said in the ultrasound? Yeah, B-scan, yes. Okay, we'll go back. This is the B-scan, yes. So, my dear, my subcroidal and diffuse RC layer thickening. This is an important thing that you can help you to diagnose uh, sure. the steroids. And, sh and we, sh we should also roll out, as uh, my colleague said, the muscular syndrome, because it is related to the malignancy. So, uh, overview of posterior scleritis, uh, it is inflammatory disease of the sclera posterior to the equator. Uh, it is represent 6% of all scleritis, 80% associated with concomitant anterior scleritis, 20% uh, associated with systemic disease. At the, uh, the age of onset is often less than 40 years. It is, um, uh, if it's more than 50, uh, 55 years old, it's most likely associated with the systemic disease. Mm -hmm. Clinical features vary. It's can, the patient come with pain, tenderness, 
and also ocular uh, motility restriction. Uh, visual prognosis is poor. It is 80% uh, uh, will develop uh, visual loss. So the disease is bilateral in 35%. Clinical presentation, 80% present as either disc swelling or oxidative RD, subretinal mass, ring, uh, ring choroidal detachment, vitritis, macular edema, subretinal oxidation, choroidal fault. If you don't have, it doesn't mean that you rule out the sclerosis, right? So you have to have something. No, the patient being treated with the steroid, and that's masking the situations. So uh, the doctor asked about the T sign. Anyone know what's the T sign? Okay, right. Yeah, yeah, accurate. Thank you very much. So uh, uh, the workup, it is we should do B scan to see if there is any uh, increase in thickness or sclera nodule, separation of tenon capsule from the sclera, this uh, edema, choroidal fold, or retinal detachment. And we can do also MR, uh, MR and CT, and it can show sclera thickening and proptosis. And we have also, uh, we can do other investigation based on the clinical features. Uh, there is a systemic association with scleratis in general, not in the posterior scleratis. Uh, so we have, uh, we should also consider this when we uh, do like uh, taking history or uh, uh, do physical examination. We should consider about all the sign and uh, clinical features. So the treatment, we should uh, treat associated systemic disease. This is the first thing. And we should treat also associated ocular complication uveitis, uh, glaucoma, and cataract. And we treat the scleratis depend on the type and the severity of the scleratis. Uh, and uh, this is my references. Uh, thank you very much. Any comment or questions? And actually, this patient been uh, worked systemically and found to have <coughs> positive rheumatoid uh, arthritis uh, and treated with systemic steroid in addition to uh, uh, immunosuppressive medication in the form of Omuran. And she is doing actually green and no more attacks that being uh, uh, developed after this combination of treatment. So systemic, uh, uh, you know, that association with posterior sclerosis is important to look for it aggressively. Otherwise, might the patient having some lethal disease like Wagner's, you know, which is an important you know, to treat and early, especially in young uh, patients. There is one of entities of malignancies, you know, that could be presented as this with the positive retinal dashment, disc swelling, you know, called dump, you know, diffuse unilateral or bilateral uh, melanomas, you know, and exactly presenting with this. So this is one of the things, if the patient not responding yes. to your treatment, especially in the early days of treatment, and let us say in the first six to 12 weeks, if there's no improvement, then you have to think about uh, lymphomas or malignancy in general, and you can take vitreous samples and this is the times that uh, to be, yani, uh, to go uh, uh, to look for uh, any the malignancy uh, possibilities. Yes, thank you very much for attending my case. And yeah, if you have any comment or questions, yeah. you thank can you. ask. Thank you. Very interesting case. Just thank I have you. a comment. Uh, how how common we have posterior sclerosis? We will have I mean motor fat KBs or anterior segment inflammation. Well, it's not, uh, it's not usually a part, you know, and, uh, it will come. Peripheral, any limbal inflammations with uh, uh, some, you know, that sort of uh, uh, developing uh, uh, KBs at that area. So you have to be careful of them. Yani. Sclerosis, if left without treatment, it will be lethal. But this is mostly with anterior fats. I think we did K ICG, but because it's not, there is no, yani, positive finding, so it's not yani, good to add something without. Yani. The only thing that you can find it in the, usually in the ICG of this patient, a uh, little bit yani, uh, uh, dilated 
deep choroidal blood vessels with staining. That's all. But nothing is special like, you know, when you have in tuberculosis, you have granoma or uh, fecates, you have uh, any subtle types of... Thank you, Hakim. Assalamu alaikum. First of all, I would like to thank Dr. Hassan Adibi for his, his uh, great uh, help and support. Uh, the case is a 29 years old obese lady, medically free, uh, came to uh, ER of Kikish complaining of headache, mostly occipital, for uh, two months and blurred vision, OU, since uh, three weeks. Uh, past ocular history is uh, unremarkable. In ocular examination, the vision was 20-25 uh, in both eyes. In the anterior chamber, 0.5 blood cells. And in fundus examination, hyperemic swollen disc with uh, some uh, colloidal folds. I'll show you. The, this is the optus when the patient come to the ER. And you can see here the hyperemic disc and some uh, striation at the uh, macular area, and there are also some regularities at the periphery of the uh, of the retina. This is the uh, optus uh, fundus photo of the other eye. The same findings. This is the OCT, and you can see here the um, irregularities of the uh, choroid, choroidal folds. This is the B scan of the patient. And in the report, uh, it was written that mild vitreous obesity is 360 degrees peripheral choroidal detachment, mild subchoroidal opacity is diffuse RC uh, layer thickening, 360 degree uh, ciliary body detachment. And this is the UBM of the same patient, and there is also ciliary body detachment to no other pathology. This is the fluorescein angiography of the patient. And you can see here in the late frames and late uh, recirculation phases, hot disk in both eyes. And we also can see here some areas of pinpoint um, leakage. This is the ICG of the patient. Uh, the patient was seen by neuroophthalmology as a suspected case of uh, idiopathic intracranial hypertension. Actually, in the ER, the patient was diagnosed as pseudotumor cerebri based on the history and uh, physical examination. She was an obese young lady with the uh, swollen disc. They did MRI for the patient, and it came as bilateral optic disc enhancement uh, plus uveal thickening suggesting uh, uveitis. Then the patient was seen by uveitis in call and started on a bed for QID. After uh, four days, uh, choroidal folds became more uh, broader, and um, the uveitis in call decided to start the patient on systemic steroids. After three days, you can he see the improvement of the choroidal fold after starting the systemic uh, steroids. And these are uh, photos of the same patient three months after starting the surgery. And the question here, what is your uh, differential diagnosis? What is the difference between this case and the previous case? Sorry? What is the, dif yani what is the difference between this case and the previous case, Azul Abdul Aziz? Yes. This is the question, yani. The, the Do you want uh, the previous uh, yeah, the, uh, fundus photo? Yes. What do you think about the coronal tissue here? Just for the screen. It's not right? And cold. And this patient is not uh, only complaining of uh, headache, mostly occipital, not complaining of deep-seated pain, which is um, against uh, posterior sacralitis. So, what's 
يعني the diagnosis is, uh, this is a typical presentation of uh, uh, VKH and when you go back to literature there are many cases reported uh, with similar presentation uh, VKH presented as uh, choroidal fold I'll talk briefly about the revised diagnostic criteria for VKH we have uh, five criteria to diagnose uh, VKH by the way this is the first international workshop on VKH uh, disease. They revised the previously um, diagnosed diagnose criteria. Uh, these five criteria, we have three categories. We can categorize when we diagnose VKH into three categories. First category is complete VKH, incomplete VKH, or probable or atypical VKH. When we have the first, only two first criteria, we call it a probable uh, VKH. When we have the first three and either the fourth or the five, we call it incomplete VKH. And when we have all the five criteria, we call it it is a complete VKH. The first criteria is no history of penetrating ocular trauma. Uh, second, no evidence of other ocular or systemic diseases. Third criteria, bilateral ocular disease. And we have early manifestations and late manifestation early manifestations of disease. Uh, we have uh, diffuse choroiditis manifested as either a focal area of sub-retinal uh, fluid or a bullous serous uh, retinal detachment. Uh, also, we have an early manifestation. If equivocal fundus findings, then both of the below, uh, either if uh, fluorescein angiography showing focal delayed choroidal perfusion, uh, pinpoint leakage, uh, pulling within the subretinal fluid, and optic nerve staining. A second is ultrasound showing diffuse choroidal thickening without posterior sicknellitis. Late manifestation of disease, we have history suggestive of the above two ocular uh, depigmentation, either uh, sunset uh, glow fundus or uh, segura sign, which is um, uh, berylimbal uh, vitiligo. And we have other ocular signs such as nomular chorioretinal depigmented scars or RPE clumping, recurrent or chronic anterior uveitis. This is the third criteria. The fourth criterion is the neurologic or auditory findings such as meningismus, tinnitus, CSF, pleocytosis. Fifth uh, criterion is integumentary findings such as uh, alopecia, polyosis, or uh, vitiligo. The same criteria. And this is the presentation, and uh, thank you. If you have any uh, question. Thank you very much. Yeah, but uh, uh, definitely why person yeah, but when you have white death syndromes, you have, this is طبعا, why I called it white death syndromes, first of all, يعني. The question is because this is just only uh, descriptive form, post in the fluorescent angiography. Only things that. So when you have a finding in the fluorescent angiography, you can go with that multifocal choroiditis. Usually they have early hypo, you know, and late hyper. And when you have, addition to that, venuifiatis or subretinal fibrosis, we called it, Multifocal choroiditis plus manifiatis. So uh, for this one, it's difficult to say. And clinically, do you think? Did you find any areas of multifocal choroiditis here? Where is it? Uh, show us. Sorry. Uh, keep this. Keep this. Keep this. Which one? Uh, this one. Yeah. Here you can find it. No. I know. I know. But did you find it here? So that's good. Go for the uh, fundus photos. Where is where is it where, where is it in the in the out yeah? What's about the autofluorescent? What's about the autofluorescent? Usually, when you have multifocal choroiditis, you have residual uh, uh, corresponding to that. So this is after resolutions. Go back to the to the fundus photos. Okay. Where is there? Maybe in the other eye. I know. Okay, this is the area what, what you are talking. So this is that help us as a focal area of 
of oxidative retinal dehiscence, and that's one of the key points for us as the uh, diagnosis of this case. <coughs> but uh, how many of these patients presented with the uh, uh, choroidal folds? And choroidal thickening, as you see, it has diffused. Well, actually, there is not. So multifocal choroidal we talk with banyufias or subretinal fibrosis this is another entities we have. We can present it once more here, and we have covered it. Actually, it is different. Usually, they're having multiple, uh, uh, multiple focal choroiditis. That deep, it's easy, easily you can, uh, you know, discover it with the fluorescent angiography and ICG, which is not the case as here. So thank you, Dr. Aziz. Thank Max. you. So this is, yeah, and usually we're encountering that we are not diagnosing PKH, except we have large excessive RD. So excessive, uh, a typical case of PKH could be presented as uh, being yeah, looking for uh, revised international criteria for PKH. So it might be happened in a case just only having mild headaches, you know, with the plenty of fusions, good fusion even though sometimes, and when you are doing your examinations, yeah, imaging for this patient, you might find a lot of pathology could, could help you. So you don't yeah, and hesitate to rule out the possibility of infections of these patients, and then go ahead with your treatment. Uh, my name is Sara Hilali. I'm a first year resident. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Dr. Hassan Adibi for giving me the opportunity to present this interesting case. I'm going to present a case uh, about choroidal mass, but with a twist. So uh, I'll take you through the journey of our patient. She first presented to our hospital on the 17th of July in 2016 as a 41 year old female uh, known to have diabetes and hypertension. She presented with sudden onset of painful decrease in vision in her left eye for four weeks. Her past ocular history is significant for um, poor vision in the right eye for a long time. Now the examination of the right eye revealed a uh, VA of hand motion, normal intraocular pressure. Pupil showed uh, relative afferent pupillary defect. Extraocular motility was within normal. Adnixa showed mild proptosis. The uh, alignment was uh, showing 30 prism diopters of XT, and slit lamp exam from the anterior segment side was within normal. Fundus uh, exam uh, revealed a uh, almost total cupping of the optic disc uh, that also looks pale. Examination of the left eye revealed a VA of 2080 with normal color vision and intraocular pressure. Pupil were reactive to light, and the motility was full. Again, this eye showed mild proptosis and the anterior segment exam was within normal. However, the fundus uh, exam revealed a um, round, L-defined mass that has a yellowish, uh, whitish color that is around two disc diameter in size. It is pushing the retina forward towards the vitreous and uh, with surrounding uh, shallow exudative retinal detachment. Also, it uh, revealed mild um, optic disc edema. So what do you think the, diagnose, the differential at this uh, moment? is one of the most yani, important differential here, especially, how old is she? 40. 40, uh, the face, metastasis is important, huh? important, especially in this case. 
and go from that. Okay, we are aggressive guys. <laughs> Thinking about the bad things before the good things. Huh? <laughs> Try as a pharmacologist. This patient is almost one eye patient, right? Having all the clear patches in the right eye, and you have to look for the cause. Okay? Mm -hmm. And now we have a problem in the good eye. So uh, the most important decision, as we say, is the cardiologist. It's important yeah. to think about it so that you are cautious about your patients. But you know. Yeah, all, all the malignancies, yeah, either lymphomas, metastasis, or uh, melanomas, this is put it in your dementia, right? And you have to work the patient for that, actually. You cannot leave them, okay? So, uh, as it has been mentioned, uh, corridor granulomas, malignancies, and metastases are almost on the top of the list, but the list goes on. So, uh, the following investigations were ordered for the patients, CBCs, LFTs, renal function, and ESR. Uh, PPD and quantiferone, ACE and lysozymes, toxo uh, ANA and rheumatoid factor, C ANCA, IgG4, and the syphilis serology. However, all uh, were within normal, uh, but the uh, PPD came back to be strongly positive with 20 millimeter in duration, and uh, the quantiferone uh, as well were, uh, was positive. Again, we ordered CT scan of the brain and orbits, which uh, showed enlargement of both lacrimal glands. And the CT scan of the chest showed an incidental finding of a calcified mass in the left breast. I'll show you the FFA and the OCT and the B scan that we uh, I ordered. I think now the situation is getting more complicated, right? Yes. <laughs> a lot of things are coming on the CT scan, also in the command, uh, as well in the <coughs> on the on the chest and the in the brain, right? Yeah. So we have uh, and lacrimal gland enlargement. Mm -hmm. So we have these two red flags as well as the positive PBD to uh, think about. So here is the FFA of the patient of the left eye showing early hypofluorescence and late uh, hyperfluorescent. Also there is an area in the optic disc that shows hyperfluorescence indicating uh, involvement of the optic disc, uh, probably inflammation. And um, here is the B scan that was ordered for the patient that shows a dome-shaped uh, mass that is measuring uh, approximately three millimeter in transverse diameter. Um, there is mild vitreous opacities, and uh, it was highly reflective on A scan, and uh, it also showed um, a positive Doppler blood flow. So, till now, do you have any pathogenomic care? Is it could help you as an ophthalmologist to this diagnosis? In all the investigation that done, none of this. Fluorescent mm -hmm. geography, if you throw the ultrasound, none of this can يعني, tell you this is the diagnosis, and you have to treat your patient. So you are still on looking, huh? searching. Yeah, sure. Okay. So the OCT also showed a uh, subretinal fluid, uh, mainly under the fovea and uh, temporal to the fovea. You can see the retinal uh, layers are um, somewhat normal around here, but here they are pushed by this um, choroidal mass, uh, causing the thinning of the retinal uh, layers. Uh, so patient came for a follow-up 10 days later, and since we uh, found this uh, highly positive PPD, uh, anti-tuberculous uh, therapy was uh, started in this patient. Uh, Isomiacid, rifampicine, pyrazinamide, and 48 uh, hours later, we started oral corticosteroids. So the patient came for her first follow-up uh, approximately one month later, uh, showing this picture on her fundus exam. So you can obviously see that the condition is getting worse. The, uh, the size of the mass is extremely larger than uh, what's previously been um, examined. And uh, even the exodus of retinal detachment is now approaching the macula and involving it as well. This is the FFA, again, showing hypofluorescence, early hypofluorescence and late hyperfluorescence. This is the B scan that shows actually the size of the, of the mass uh, tripling in size, uh, reaching approximately 10 millimeter in transverse diameter. And um, so at this moment, what would you think? The patient is on anti-TB medication for one month, and um, she's not responding, and her condition is getting worse. So what is your uh, thoughts about this? We need help. Sorry? Lymphoma. Okay. Of course. Yes. Yes. And we yeah. have special this is small, you know, you know, calcified uh, mass you know, and calcified the yeah, mass on the left uh, uh, breast. So this is what really I yeah, need, yeah, need. So what you will do in a case that you are here? Lacrimal gland, yeah, that right? Yes. yes. Yeah, I think so. What is what was the report? So the lacrimal gland biopsy was inconclusive, uh, and uh, for uh, sarcoidosis or any other, it actually showed non-grammatous, non-specific inflammation. 
We also sent her for a general hospital uh, to uh, check the uh, lesion incidental finding in the left breast to do mammogram and FNA also came back to be uh, of benign origin. Policies, yes. Uh, uh, ACE and lysozymes were negative, and uh, mm. were negative. Negative. Yeah, excellent, mashallah. So we kept the patient on anti-TB medication. She came for her next follow-up, which was uh, approximately two months after that. Uh, this was her uh, fundus uh, photos showing uh, almost complete regression of the uh, mass. And those are the FFAs, and the B-scan also shows regression of the size of the uh, choroidal mass, or we can say choroidal granuloma. Uh, so, um, and uh, the vision improved also to 2020. So, what are paradoxical uh, reactions or response to anti TB therapy? It is when the patient is started on anti TB medications and then the condition either worsens or a new lesion develops. So, the pathophysiology behind it, as Dr. Abu Saif mentioned, it is a complex uh, interplay between the uh, host immune response and the uh, mycobacterial antigens. So what are the known risk factors? It has been frequently reported with HIV positive patients. Uh, the frequency is unknown for HIV negative patients. There's one study who tried to determine uh, some of the risk factors that can predict for you which patients would get this response uh, if anti-TB is started. So they looked at the uh, initial baseline investigation such as uh, in the CBC. So they found that if the patient is uh, highly anemic, or severely anemic, uh, with low lymphocytes and low albumin, it would uh, put him at a higher risk of developing this reaction. Um, but our patient had a normal CBC and normal albumin level. So it has unpredictable timing. Uh, some patients, it can be as early as two weeks from uh, starting the anti-TB medication or as late as 18 months. Uh, so the, it has unpredictable timing. Uh, the improvement has been reported so if you suspect paradoxical reaction and the patient is anti-TB medication, when would he show improvement later on? It is variable again. It can be from two to six weeks. Um, and they advised to uh, start the steroids therapy uh, along with anti-TB therapy, and we, we're already doing that in, uh, in our patients. Uh, these are some of the case reports that I've talked about. And uh, so the take-home message from this uh, case that paradoxical reactions are a common condition and it is uh, diagnosed by exclusion, and it poses a clinical challenge for the treating physician, uh, and it requires high index of suspicion. So these are my references, and thank you for your attention. Yes, thank you very much. Excellent. I think this is really a, yeah, a case that's challenging, but, uh, you know, uh, suppose that you don't have any clue that the patient is improving. What would be your next step? Suppose that mass is stalled, not improving, not um, getting any yeah, regress. So what you will do? And actually, we have plan B for here, even though. Because we have first the life of the patient, second is the vision of the patient. The life of the patient to make sure that she doesn't have malignancy, Malignant. right? And sometimes might be the only possible, especially after this negative workup from the, even though from the oncologist, mm -hmm. you know, that we have to go to take uh, uh, either 
Fitria samples or you have to go to the mass itself because in such a case like that with the clear Fitrias might be, it's not, yani, the yield will not be high. So it's, 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 if it's a good, if you can go make any yani, biopsy from the choroidal mass, although, although it is in the macula. Yani, put that in your mind. Mm -hmm. So you have either any yani, fine needle, aspiration to go from outside mm -hmm. and directed by the ultrasound, or you will go in and then you will do temporal uh, uh, choroidal biopsy. This is the, the scenarios that in case that no response, but thanks, alhamdulillah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, that she is responding and she's doing. Now we're working hard for her because I'm looking what are the systemic diseases she's having with her neurologist that saw her maybe eight years ago, who is yani, uh, never give us a good yani, report to know what's going on. I was in my, my, in my mind that yani one of the closest you know, uh, uh, systemic disease is the systemic sarcoidosis. That's the one that could come with facial pulses and multiple cranial nerves, and that being reported, it's not just only one or two cases, multiple cases. But I, yani, till now I don't have something in my hands that could yani, support this. Um, and positive <coughs> BBD itself, it's usually, again, it's the diagnosis of sarcoidosis, 20 millimeter in durations, and positive quantiferon, which is usually if the patient is having sarcoidosis, it shouldn't become positive as this, as that. Uh, yeah, it doesn't show that uh, cassating yani, granuloma or even tuberculosis yani, itself. Yani. So yani, uh, sometimes you have to face these challenging cases and try your best to help this patient. Thank you, doctor. Because we are yani, short of time, huh? we are going for one more challenging case. Okay, doctor? I'll be quick. Great. Bye. Okay. Uh, my name is Dream Al-Ahmadi. I'm an R1 in Kekesh. So my case is about, uh, about a severe body mass. And a 50-year-old gentleman came to Kekish in the emergency room complaining of pain, redness, and photophobia in the right eye for the past one year. The patient has to, uh, been to another hospital and has been told that he has an eye inflammation and was given a prednisolone acetate, drops, and oral steroids, and then referred as a ciliary body growth. So um, and the medical history was unremarkable. On ocular examination, you can notice his, uh, in his right eye, which is the complaining eye, is uh, light perception and has high intraocular pressure of 46 millimercury and mild uh, conjunctival congestion and posterior synechia plus one cellular reaction and plus two flare. Uh, and there are pigments on the interior capsule of the lens. And, uh, and this is the uh, image of uh, his uh, anterior segment. On um, fundus examination, there was no view to the fundus, and there is the obvious uh, growth on the temporal side of the uh, retina. We did a base scan. Uh, mild, there was mild vitreous opacity, almost 360 retinal detachment. Uh, detected from the disc to the equator, and uh, multiple subretinal opacities. Uh, macula was off at that time. Choroidal detachment detected in the superior temporal and the inferior temporal, which is the side of the uh, fundus photo, and dense subchoroidal uh, opacities. And the A scan uh, showed low reflectivity. On UVM, there was diffuse dust-like opacity and diffuse peripheral choroidal lesion detected temporally and superior temporal, about 6.2 millimeter in elevation. Cilia body invasion uh, in the superior temporal by UVM, and it was avascular by Doppler. And uh, the UVM uh, reports, it's, it's not typical of melanoma. MRI of the brain in orbit showed evidence of curved linear structure seen within the temporal choroidal area from 7 to 11 o'clock, seen within the posterior segment extending from the ciliary body, posteriorly just passing the equator. Otherwise unremarkable, CT scan of the chest was unremarkable for pulmonary tuberculosis or sarcoidosis. So, patient was managed for his uh, high intraocular pressure and then IOP regressed to 13 and 16 millimercury. 72 hours later, the PBD mantis text, uh, test was strongly positive of 22, uh, 20 millimeter in duration. So what are your differential diagnoses? Yeah, just I would like to mention one thing about this. This mm -hmm. patient had two BBDs. The patient was on systemic steroids coming from outside 
and the first PVD ca uh, came negative. Mm. And that's making the, our situation was that time not good, yani. Mm. And based on this, we repeated again with 10, uh, you know, that uh, your international units and showed the positivity. Although it is not a rule, anyway. Uh, and that was supported with the quantity of right? So that's make things for us easy, but look us, let us look what's going on this patient. Okay, so my differential diagnoses are mainly congenital of iris cysts or traumatic, could be trapped foreign body, inflammatory, could be sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, syphilis, or fungal lesion. And third is the malignancies, either medulloepithelioma, melanoma, or lymphoma. On the 26th of October, 2014, patient was started on anti-TB medication. And then on the November 4th, UBM came back with regressed elevation to 5.1 millimeter, which was 6.6 .6 before. On the 30th of uh, November, patient was started on a 20 milligram prednisolone, and then another UBM on the uh, on uh, April 2015 with a regressed mass of 2.2 millimeter, and there was a no other pathology. On 17th of November 2015, the B scan shows a mild diffuse uh, vitreous opacity and retracted PVD and there's thickening area detected almost superior temporal to the max, uh, with maximum elevation of 1.7, which was 2.2 before. Slightly irregular macular area and no RD or other pathology. I have to mention that the patient had yeah. subretinal fluid and uh, exudative retinal detachment before. Uh, on UBM, uh, the patient had a regressed and atrophic uh, ciliary body on November 2015. So nine months later, uh, the vision has recovered from light perception into 20 to 100 with plus two ciliary action, ciliary body atrophy, and resolved exudative retinal detachment. Patient is still kept on topical steroid until this day. So this is the uh, image of the fundus after the treatment, which shows the area of the mass, which involved the ciliary body and choroid up to the equator. And this is uh, his OCT on 2017 of February. Um, and he had a, cystoid, a little bit early of cystoid macular edema of the right eye. And thank you. Thank you. Uh, yeah, yeah, actually, this is similar to the previous case, but because already with the differential in the, so in a case like that, challenging patient treated outside your uh, hospital, you don't know what you are dealing, but putting in your mind, uh, one eye, uh, this eye is having light perceptions, there was no difficulty to take hold of the globe, but putting that in, uh, in, in your and patient improving to 2100 from light perception, so try to fight with the anti-TB, Follow your patients. This patient already will take consultation of oncologist ocular, and really based on the you know that uh, ultrasound, uh, ultrasound finding, it showed that most likely it is not malignant. It's most likely granuloma. So uh, 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 tuberculosis is one of the great mimickers. It can present as anything that you believe, from sarcoidosis to malignancy. So don't give up. If you have highly positive PVD. Don't give up. Go ahead. Treat him till you give him two, three months in treatment, and then you can change in your mind to go aggressive to take biopsy or even though to inoculate the eye. No, 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 no. It was high IOB. <laughs> yeah, it was been lost eye, but uh, with the with the treatment, get back to that. Now he's in anti glaucoma, Zolomol, I think, and alpha gan, and he's maintaining good pressure. Thank you very much, guys. Yes. One eye is patient, 
I will think in the one-eyed patient usually, and he's looking if the patient is saturated. Yeah. No, no, the patient is coming from far away, so we will get to see it. And I will not think about compliance here, because this is good treatment. I'm sure that I'm stressing a lot. So most of the patients, they, they will go for the treatment, because the treatment is affected.